The Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations will come to order. Today's hearing is entitled, Fueling Terror, the Dangers of Ransom Payments to Iran. Without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare a recess of the Subcommittee at any time. And without objection, all members will have five legislative days with when, with, uh, within which to submit extraneous materials to the Chair for inclusion in the record. Without objection, members of the full committee, who are not members of this subcommittee, may participate in today's hearing for the purpose of making an opening statement and questioning the witnesses. The Chair now recognizes himself for two and a half minutes for an opening statement. Today's hearing will examine the Obama administration's $1.7 billion cash payment to Iran to settle long-standing claims predating the Iran Revolution. While the settlement was disclosed in January, New details about the payment surfaced uh, in August when the Wall Street Journal reported that $400 million of that payment was converted into Swiss francs and euros and then flown to Iran in cash on the same day that five American detainees were released from the Islamic Republic. On Tuesday, administration officials were forced to admit that the remaining $1.3 billion it paid to Iran in interest was also handed over in uh, cold, hard cash. Despite vigorous denials that there was any link between the payment and the release of American prisoners, the evidence um, uh, presented by the administration makes it difficult to believe. Iran officials uh, certainly believe that this was a ransom payment. A, a Revolutionary Guard commander said on state media that, quote, taking this much money back was in return for the release of the Americans, period, end quote. And one of the prisoners, Pastor Saeed Abedini, recalled that while waiting to be freed, Iran police told him that, quote, we are waiting for another plane, so if the plane doesn't come, we never let you go. Sounds like a ransom payment. In an effort to corroborate the, the administration's claims, this committee requested records about the payment from Treasury and the Department of Justice more than a month ago. And to date, the self-proclaimed most transparent administration in our history has failed to provide any, not one document, to this committee. And the witnesses here today uh, only agreed to appear under threat of subpoena. With jurisdiction over terror financing, this committee has a right and a responsibility to understand the facts surrounding this peculiar payment. While there is much that we don't know, we can be sure that Iran is committed to its support for terrorist groups like Hezbollah the enemy of Israel and the West, whose leader earlier in the year admitted that he virtually gets all of his funding from the Iranian mullahs. Iran's support uh, also goes to Bashar al-Assad, the Syrian dictator who uses chemical weapons on his own civilian people. I look forward to an explanation from our witnesses why we would make it so easy for Iran to continue to fuel terrorism by U.S. taxpayer expense. With that, my time has expired, and I yield uh, to the gentleman and the ranking member from Texas, uh, Mr. Green, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I appreciate greatly the opportunity to bring some clarity to this issue and to a good many other issues. William Cullen Bryant is right. Truth crushed to earth shall rise again. So today, I'd like to take the opportunity to resurrect the truth, to resuscitate the truth, if you will. And the truth is this. The genesis of this hearing is a meeting that took place at or near the time President Obama was being sworn in, when a group of very powerful Republicans met and made a conscious decision to do everything they could to block any and everything the president attempted to do. At that meeting were the top leaders of the House of Representatives today. At that meeting was a person who sits on this very committee. And people from that day forward have been committed to blocking everything that the president brings forth. And the truth be told, they've done a fairly good job. So I don't agree with the style of the hearing today. I think that a better style for this hearing would be, don't bother me with facts, my mind's made up. I think a better style for the hearing would be, we kept our word, 
because that's exactly what's happening today. We have a circumstance wherein Americans who are being held prisoners have been brought home. The exchange was money that was owed to the people who were holding the Americans, and we are condemning that. You would think that we'd have a parade. The president would be saluted. The people who negotiated would be applauded. But this committee chooses to do what it has consistently done, and that is to deny this president any success that they can block. Let's just look at the evidence of what I, of which I speak. Dodd-Frank, they fought it tooth and nail and are still fighting it and would, if they could, today eliminate the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Obamacare, they have not replaced it. They don't have a replacement for it. They'll repeal it, but they don't have a replacement. And we voted more than 50 times to repeal Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act. The XM Bank, something that has traditionally been agreed upon, that has been of great benefit to this country, we had to have an unusual process to take place to keep the XM Bank functioning, and still we cannot make loans over $10 million because a committee on the Senate side refuses to appoint additional appoint, uh, appointees to that FM Bank board. We have refused not we, the Republicans, to even discuss the budget. Usually the budget comes up, there's a hearing, it's discussed, and a decision is made. They have refused to discuss the budget. And finally, the Supreme Court. Who would have thought that we would hold up the Supreme Court's nomination simply because of an agenda that has been set to make sure that this president does not have a, track, a, a, a record of success, a track record of success. So here's where we are, and I'm going to keep bringing it up. This won't be the last time today. Here's where we are. We've got people on this committee who were at that hearing, at least one person, uh, that meeting that took place. We've got two members of the senior leadership in the House who were there and they are honoring their commitment. That's what this hearing is about today, keeping their word, making sure that they do everything that they can to stop this president. As a matter of fact, what started out as a simple stop the president has gone on steroids now, and it is all, literally an effort to destroy the presidency, it seems to some, not all. This is disgraceful, if you want to know the truth. I do not believe that this is the conduct that a committee of the Statue of Financial Services should be engaged in. We will become the kerfuffle committee if we are not careful. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Henselin, for two and a half minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for convening an incredibly important hearing today. Any person here today can take out their iPhone or electronic device and Google Merriam-Webster's definition of ransom. Quote, money that is paid in order to free someone who has been captured or kidnapped. The American people want to know, did this administration pay ransom? Does it meet the legal definition? And if it doesn't, did, it, did the actions of this administration tragically achieve the same end, and that is to incent terrorists, to kidnap American citizens, to put a price on the head of every tourist, soldier, sailor, airman, and Marine who serves or visits overseas? Was the cash, cash transaction legal? My guess is if any private citizen had done what this administration had done, they would be indicted on money laundering. Instead, the administration calls it diplomacy. Was the cash transaction legal? If so, should it be legal? 
And if perfectly legal, why did the administration go to such great lengths to hide it from the American people? Why did it take a Wall Street Journal expose to bring the true nature of this transaction to our attention? Why did I have to threaten subpoenas to get the administration to show up in the first place? Did the Iranians demand that this payment be made in cash? We have a terrorist finance task force here that knows it is cash, cash transactions that fuel terrorism. And it is the Obama State Department, which is labeled Iran, quote, the world's foremost state sponsor of terrorism. It is the President's Treasury Department that has classified it as, quote, a jurisdiction of primary money laundering concern. Then why, Mr. Chairman, why were they given $1.7 billion, $1.3 of which was interest taxpayer money that could have gone to the United States Army, but instead apparently is going to the Iranian Revolutionary Guard? The American people deserve answers. Mr. Chairman, thank you for demanding the answers and calling this hearing. I yield back. The gentleman and chairman yields back. Uh, I now want to welcome our panel and witnesses today. Uh, for introduction, Mr. Uh, Backemeyer is the State Department's Deputy Assistant Secretary for Iran Affairs and the former Deputy Coordinator for Sanction Policy. Uh, Ms. Grosh is the State Department's Assistant Legal Advisor in the Office of Internal Claims and Investigative Disputes. Uh, Ms. McCord is the Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the uh, National Security Division of the Justice Department. And Mr. Ahern is the Assistant General Counsel for Enforcement and Intelligence at the Treasury Department. Uh, welcome uh, to all of you. Uh, the witnesses in a moment will be recognized for five minutes uh, uh, to give an oral presentation of their testimony. Without objection, the witnesses' written statements will be, will be made a part of the record following their oral remarks. I would note that uh, I don't believe you have provided written statements, but I anticipate those statements uh, will be coming, and so the Chair intends to submit any witness statements pursuant to general leave for inclusion in the hearing record. Uh, once witnesses have uh, finished presenting their testimony, each member of the subcommittee will have five minutes within, uh, within which to ask uh, the panel questions. On your table, I would just note there are three lights. Green means go, uh, yellow means you have one minute left, and red means your time is up. Uh, the microphones are sensitive, uh, so please make sure you're speaking directly uh, into them. And with that, uh, Mr. Backemeyer, you are now recognized for your opening statement for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as you said, my name is Chris Backemeyer, and I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Iranian Affairs. Uh, I'm a career State Department official, and I've worked on Iran for the better part of the last decade. Uh, I welcome the opportunity to come before the committee, as well as the American people, uh, and describe and correct some of the misunderstandings about the Hague Claims Tribunal settlement that was reached in January of this year. Uh, as you know, President Obama and Secretary Kerry announced the settlement on January 17th, when it was concluded and specifically noted that the settlement involved $400 million for the FMS Trust Fund that had been established with Iranian funds, as well as $1.3 billion as a compromise on interest on this sum. This was also posted on the State Department website. After the announcement, we received inquiries from Congress, and in each case, we offered to provide closed briefing to members and staff. Uh, and one member requested such a briefing, which we did provide. The Hague Claim Settlement resurfaced in the press again recently, as you've noted. And again, we received questions, and again, we offered to provide a closed briefing. After, uh, two days ago, we provided two such briefings to House staff and, and to Senate staff. And we are happy to be here today to continue discussing this issue and all of the things that we have accomplished for the American people through our diplomatic efforts toward Iran. I should note at the outset that there will be limitations to what I and my colleagues can say in an open setting. As I mentioned earlier, we've previously offered closed briefings because there are a number of litigation and diplomatic sensitivities that could jeopardize U.S. interests if we were to go into too much detail. Specifically, as my colleague will explain in a minute, the settlement in January addressed a significant part, but only one part, of a much larger multi-billion dollar claim which is being actively litigated. Iran has a long history of mining the U.S. public record for ammunition to use, us against, uh, use against us in claims litigation. That, this includes statements that have been made in congressional briefings. As a result, it's is extremely important that we not say anything in a public setting that would jeopardize our defenses to Iran's remaining claims at the tribunal. With those limitations, though, I will proceed to provide you with as much information as I can. 
I think the best way to start is to take a moment to summarize a series of events that occurred on the weekend of January 16th and 17th, a weekend where we finalized a number of diplom diplomatic efforts that advanced U.S. interests in significant ways. As you may be aware at this time, the United States was pursuing multiple lines of effort that we sought to finalize on or around the same time in mid-January. First, we were on the verge of implementing the nuclear deal and the International Atomic Energy Agency, or IAEA, was in the process of verifying that Iran had met all of its commitments under the deal. On that weekend, Iran's breakout timeline went from less than 90 days to over a year, uh, and 98 percent of its enriched uranium stockpile was removed and extensive transparency measures were implemented. At the same time, we were pushing to finalize an arrangement to get several wrongly detained American citizens, including Post Report, Washington Post reporter Jason Rezaian, Christian pastor Said, Saeed Abedini, and former Marine Amir Hekmati safely out of Tehran, which was a top priority for us and one that I know Congress shared. We had been pressing the Iranians to release these Americans at every opportunity throughout the negotiations of the nuclear deal and continued our efforts to secure the release over 14 months of separate discussions. These individuals were face facing lengthy prison terms, if not potentially worse sentences on Trump dump, national security, and espionage charges. And lastly, our lawyers were working to finalize the settlement of a long-standing claim that the Iranians had filed at the Iran-U.S. Claims Tribunal regarding the Foreign Military Sales Trust Fund. The issue of settling the large remaining claim uh, a number of times, or, uh, sorry, the issue of settling the large remaining claims at The Hague, including the Trust Fund, had been raised by Iran a number of times over the years. The Iranians had been making a push at the tribunal to have a hearing on this case, and we knew they were eager to settle the case so that they could address critical economic needs. As my colleague will describe in a moment, we realized that we could take advantage of the importance that Iran attached to recovering the principal from the FMS Trust Fund in order to drive a bargain on the 37 years of interest. Now, there's been much, recently much attention paid to the timing of this, these various issues. So I think it's worth clarifying uh, here today, or I think it's worth clarifying some of the mischaracterizations uh, here today. It's important to remember that for more than three decades, we've had no diplomatic relations with Iran in minimal diplomatic con contact. As a result, there was significant risk that any one of these efforts could unravel at any time. The one we were most worried about was the consular dialogue, where we feared that our American citizens would not be, uh, would not be freed. We therefore had some pretty sig or, this process had gone in fits and starts, and there were elements inside of Iran extremely opposed to any sort of arrangement in which our citizens would be freed, and we had some pretty significant concerns that it would unravel. On on January 16th and 17th, when after the terms of the consular arrangement had been finalized and the Swiss were just about ready to fly our people out of Tehran, our fears were realized when we were unable to locate the wife and mother of Jason Rezaian. It was agreed that Jason's wife and mother would also be allowed to leave Iran as part of this deal, so their disappearance was highly concerning. At this point, the IAEA had verified Iran's commitments on the JCPOA and the nuclear deal had begun, and my colleagues at the Treasury Department had begun the necessary arrangements to refund the principal and the FMS trust fund, but the payment had not yet occurred. When this uncertainty presented itself, we became very concerned and decided to take a pause before finalizing this other line of effort, specifically the finalization of the payment for the settlement of the FMS Trust Fund. After a stressful night of uncertainty and after several high-level phone calls, including by Secretary Kerry, we were able to confirm the location of Jason's wife and mother and, th and get them on an airplane so that they could leave, leave Iran. With that resolved, we moved forward with the reciprocal humanitarian gesture in which we provided relief to certain Iranian nationals, including several du dual U.S. Iranian nationals that had primarily been charged with sanctions-related crimes. And we reinitiated our efforts to finalize the outstanding actions that we had agreed to on the Hague Claims Tribunal, including the refund of Iran's FMS trust fund principal. This decision was made out of prudence when the success of our diplomatic efforts was in serious doubt. So we took the prudent step to pause, assess the situation, and resolve our concerns before moving forward. Through these negotiating tracks, we were able to conclude these issues in a manner that advanced our core interests, again, ensuring Iran can never have a nuclear weapon, potentially saving taxpayers billions of dollars on this claim, and freeing wrongfully detained Americans as well as their family members. Again, each of these arrangements was analyzed on its own merits and determined to be in U.S. interests. The release of several U.S. citizens, along with Jason Rezaian's mother and wife by Iran, was based on reciprocal humanitarian gesture in which we provided relief to certain Iranian nationals, including several dual-use Iranian nationals. And the release of the FMS trust fund monies was based on a settlement of Iran's claim for those monies and for 37 years of interest, a settlement that was highly favorable to the United States. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I now recognize Ms. Grosch for five minutes.
You have to touch your microphone. Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am the Assistant Legal Advisor for International Claims and Investment Disputes at the Department of State, where I've worked to defend the United States against Iran at the Hague uh, Tribunal for nearly 30 years. Over that time, we have won some cases, we have lost some, and sometimes we have decided to settle. And I'm here today to explain as best as I can in this, this, in this setting uh, the settlement that was announced in January. As my colleague, Mr. Backemeyer, explained, this was only a partial settlement of a very large case. The rest of that case is ongoing at the Hague Tribunal today. Because of that, I am limited in what I can discuss in this public setting. As he explained, Iran and its lawyers are vigilant in scouring the public record for statements or information that they can use against us in these arbitrations. In fact, I can recall being in the Hague Tribunal many times and hearing Iran quote extensively from things that witnesses and members of Congress said in hearings trying to use that to their advantage. These are multi-billion dollar claims against the United States. So for some of your questions, I may need to defer the question to a closed setting, like the one that we did for House and Senate staff earlier this week. Now, to provide some background, the United States and Iran entered into the Algiers Accords in 1981, which created the, Hague's tri the Hague Tribunal. And it was primarily created to address claims of uh, U.S. nationals, but also claims between the two governments. The agreement was entered into by the Carter administration, it was endorsed by the Reagan administration, and was debated by both houses of Congress. And in the end, it was determined that the Algiers Accords and the tribunal process were of great benefit to the United States and U.S. nationals. In the first 20 years of the tribunal process, it focused primarily on resolving claims of U.S. nationals for debt, contract, expropriation, and other measures affecting property rights. U.S. citizens and companies received over $2.5 billion in awards and settlements from that process. And there were significant government-to-government -government claims that were also filed at the tribunal. The majority and certainly the largest were by Iran against the United States, including Iran's large contract claims arriving, arising out of its former foreign military sales program. Like other FMS customers, Iran paid money into a trust fund that was used to facilitate prompt payment to the U.S. contractors working on Iranian contracts. But by January 1979, Iran had already been struggling to make the necessary payments on its more than 1,000 outstanding FMS contracts. In February 1979, Iran and the United States concluded a memorandum of understanding providing for the cancellation of many of the remaining purchases. The two sides worked on implementing the MOU and to wind down Iran's FMS program over the ensuing months. But as we all know, in November 1979, the hostages were taken and those efforts became to uh, an end. The dispute over the FMS trust fund and interest, which resulted in the settlement in January of this year, was part of Iran's FMS claims that it filed with the tribunal in 1982. So you can imagine the scale of it and the money involved. It is a giant breach of contract case covering 1,126 huge uh, FMS contracts. Before the settlement in January, other parts of the FMS claims were decided or settled some time ago. Indeed, settlement discussions over technical legal matters have been held in this channel for decades, typically led by the State Department legal advisor and the Iranian presidential legal advisor. My estimate is that since the early 1980s, through the Reagan, Bush, and Clinton administrations, some 40 rounds of claims meetings have occurred at this level. Indeed, the prior settlements with Iran of other portions of the FMS claims occurred during the first Bush administration. In 1989, for example, the United States and Iran settled a claim for $7.5 million for spare parts. It was paid from the judgment fund. In 1990, the parties enter into a partial settlement for $200 million from the trust fund. And this is the same trust fund that was the subject of the final settlement in January. And in 1991, the parties also settled Iran's claim for titled FMS assets for $278 million, and this was paid from the judgment fund. Apart from the FMS claims, there were other significant settlements between the parties, including in 1990, when Iran paid the United States $105 million from, uh, in settlement of certain U.S. national claims and U.S. government claims. These settlements, and in particular the FMS settlements, were reached at key moments in the cases, such as before key hearings or when they were on the verge of going to decision. In the past two years, as proceedings at the tribunal have been advancing, we revisited the possibility of settlement of tribunal claims through 2014 and 2015. 
These discussions led to settlement of small claims that were the subject of ongoing hearings. They involved architectural drawings and were, that were transferred to the Tehran Museum of Contemporary Art and for fossils that were transferred to the Ministry of the Environment. In the spring of 2015, after years of extensive briefing, Iran pressed the tribunal to schedule comprehensive hearings in these remaining FMS claims. The tribunal ordered both parties to file their respective proposals for the structure of hearings, and Iran filed its proposal on November 11, 2015. Iran was also pressing for a preliminary ruling on issues including the outstanding balance of the FMS trust fund and interest since 1979. <clears throat> They sought interest based on a provision in the 1979 Memorandum of Understanding calling for unexpended FMS funds associated with Iran's FMS program to be placed in an interest-bearing account. With the settlements over the smaller claims concluded in December 2015 and with the hearings in the FMS claims on the horizon, we were able to achieve this most recent settlement, which finally and fully resolves Iran's claim for funds in the FMS trust fund as well as interest since 1979. As we publicly announced in January, pursuant to the settlement, Iran received the balance of $400 million in the FMS trust fund, as well as roughly $1.3 billion representing a compromise on the interest. The trust fund balance of $400 million was paid from Iranian funds that were deposited in the FMS trust fund uh, itself in connection with the program. The payment for the compromise on interest was provided out of the judgment fund, as was the case for the largest prior settlement of the FMS claims during the Bush administration. If Iran's claims for the trust fund balance and interest had gone to decision in the Hague Tribunal, the United States could well have faced significant exposure in the billions of dollars. Iran, of course, was seeking very high rates of interest for a period of over three decades. We were able to secure a favorable resolution on the interest and avoid the potential for a much larger award against us. The details of why we settled for this amount is litigation sensitive, and getting into that explanation would get at other issues still pending at the tribunal. Iran's lawyers would try to use my words, or maybe even your words, against us to help their position at the tribunal. But what I can say here today is that I believe that this settlement was the best thing for the United States. It was the best way to avoid a possible decision from the tribunal ordering us to pay a lot more. Thank you. Thank you. The, cha the chair now recognizes Ms. McCord. Good morning, And I'm on for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Duffy, Ranking Member Green, and members of the subcommittee. Um, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the Department of Justice's role in the settlement of Iran's claim before the Iran-U.S. Claims Tribunal at The Hague for the funds in the Foreign Military Sales, or FMS, uh, trust fund, as well as Iran's associated claim for interest on those funds. As the Attorney General has made clear uh, when the deal was first announced in January, the Department of Justice fully supported the administration's resolution of several issues with Iran, including the settlement of the Hague Tribunal claim involving the FMS fund, as well as the arrangements that led to the return of U.S. citizens detained in Iran. With respect to the Hague settlement, when there is a settlement of litigation that is pending against the United States, it is generally paid from the judgment fund unless there is a separate source of funding for the settlement. For a payment of a settlement to be made from the judgment fund, the Attorney General must certify to the Treasury that the payment of the settlement is in the best interests of the United States. Here, the Attorney General approved the settlement and certified payment from the judgment fund of the portion of the settlement that resolved the interest dispute. The certification was based on the Department of Justice's typical assessment for a judgment fund payment. Assessment of a settlement payment from the judgment fund includes consideration of the exposure that the United States faces from the claim proposed for settlement. It also considers the likelihood of an adverse ruling against the United States, the likely size of such an award, the background of the litigation, the tribunal, relevant legal arguments, relevant facts, and governing legal doctrines. The Department's certification of this settlement payment from the Judgment Fund was based on the assessment that it was in the best interests of the United States, that the payment was significantly less than the United States' exposure under the claims for the balance in the FMS account and the interest on those funds. 
The Department of Justice was also involved in the consular negotiations with Iran and in effectuating the ultimate arrangements that led to the release of the detained American citizens. In this regard, the Department identified certain criminal cases involving Iranian and Iranian-American defendants for which relief could be provided as a reciprocal humanitarian gesture. The defendants in these cases had been charged primarily with violating the U.S. trade embargo. None were charged with terrorist activity or other violent crimes. As has been noted previously, the ultimate arrangement involved the pardon or commutation of seven defendants who had been convicted or were awaiting trial in the United States and the dismissal of criminal charges against 14 others, all of whom were located outside the United States and for whom our attempts to obtain custody through extradition had failed or were assessed to be likely to fail. The Department was also responsible for preparing and filing the paperwork related to the pardons, commutations, and dismissals. I thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. McCord. Uh, Mr. Ahern, you are now recognized for five minutes. Chairman Duffy, Ranking Member Green, uh, thank you for inviting me to testify this morning. I'm very pleased to be here with my colleagues from the State Department and the Justice Department. My name is Paul Ahern, and I'm the Assistant General Counsel for Enforcement and Intelligence at the Treasury Department. I'm here today to discuss with you Treasury's role in effectuating the payments related to the January 2016 settlement of a long outstanding claim at the Iran United States Claims Tribunal at The Hague. The settlement involved two payments by the United States regarding an account established decades ago with Iranian funds, as well as the compromise of its claim for interest on that account. The administration publicly announced the $1.7 billion settlement on January 17, 2016 and that announcement is publicly available at the State Department's website. Now, for the first settlement payment, Treasury assisted the Defense Finance and Accounting Service, or DFAS, in crafting a wire instruction to transfer $400 million on January 14, 2016. The $400 million came out of what is typically referred to as the Foreign Military Sales Trust Fund, or the FMS account. It had amounted to about $600 million until 1990, when the Bush administration entered into a settlement returning $200 million to Iran, and since that time the fund has amounted to about $400 million. Treasury worked with DFAS and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York so that the funds transferred from DFAS to a European bank. The funds were then converted to a foreign currency, were withdrawn as foreign currency banknotes, and physically transported to Geneva. On January 17th, Treasury dispersed the payment to an official from the Central Bank of Iran for transfer to Tehran. The funds were under U.S. government control until their disbursement pursuant to the settlement. The second payment, involving settlement of the dispute over accrued interest, was dispersed out of the Judgment Fund. The Judgment Fund is the source of funding Congress has provided for use generally in paying judgments and settlements of claims against the United States when there is no other source of funding. Awards and settlements of tribunal claims have been paid from the Judgment Fund in the past, including a $278 million settlement reached in 1991. Though the payment to settle the dispute over accrued interest was one payment, the Judgment Fund system has a technical limitation that prevents it from processing individual claims in amounts over 10 digits in length. Uh, therefore, the single claim of $1.3 billion was broken into 13 claims of $99,999,999.99 and the remainder of $10,390,236.28. As in similar prior instances, the system's technical limitation required a claim to be divided into these smaller amounts. These amounts are displayed on Treasury's Judgment Fund website, as is additional information about claims processing through the Judgment Fund. Treasury dispersed the payment after receiving the appropriate approvals from the Department of Justice. The payment from the Judgment Fund was initiated through a transfer to a European bank. In this circumstance, it was held available for disbursement to Iran. Pursuant to an arrangement between Iran, the home country of the European bank, in the United States, the European Bank converted the $1.3 billion into a foreign currency, withdrew the foreign currency in foreign currency banknotes, and then dispersed the funds as banknotes to an official from the Central Bank of Iran. This process occurred in two installments, one on January 22nd and one on February 5th. Now, I would note that the sanctions regime we built with our international partners had effectively cut off Iran from the international financial system. Iran was very aware of the difficulties it would face in accessing and using the funds if they were in any other form than cash, 
even if after the lifting of sanctions under the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, or JCPOA. Therefore, effectuating the payment of the funds in the FMS account and the subsequent interest payments in cash was the most reliable way to ensure that, that they received the funds in a timely manner, and it was the method preferred by the relevant uh, foreign banks. For both the payments to settle the dispute over principal and the interest, no direct transfer was made from any U.S. account to Iran. In addition, these transactions complied with U.S. sanctions law and did not require a unique license, waiver, or other form of authorization. Treasury's regulations at Title 31 of the Code of Federal Regulations, Section 560.510, explicitly authorize all transactions necessary to payments pursuant to settlement agreements entered into by the United States government in a legal proceeding in which the United States is a party, such as a settlement of claims before the tribunal. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify about these issues, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, panel. Uh, the chair now recognizes himself for five minutes. Uh, the panel has made a point of uh, noting that you don't want any information coming from this hearing that could jeopardize your negotiations for future settlements, uh, duly noted. But uh, to the panel, um, any of the $1.7 billion that has been provided in cash to Iran, is any of that going to be used for terrorism? And can you guarantee me that that money won't be used to harm any Americans? Mr. Backmeyer. Congressman, thank you for your question. Um, it's our assessment that the vast majority of the money that Iran has gotten from both this settlement as well as other... Can you other... guarantee me that? That's my question. Can you guarantee this money won't be used for terrorism or to hurt Americans? As I said, it's our assessment that the vast majority has gone uh, to the, the economic, the critical economic needs that Iran has had. Now, I can't speak can't to every see. dollar that's going to go in or out of Iran, as you know. Uh, but what I, I can tell you is that we have a variety of tools that we use to counter but I, but those I, I, activities. I was looking for a guarantee. And so I just want to note that there is a risk that uh, you have taken in providing $1.7 billion to the lead sponsor of terrorism in the world. Uh, I don't want to be chastised uh, on this committee about information that could hurt your negotiations when I think uh, this deal has uh, endangered the security in the region and for U.S. citizens. But let's set that aside for a moment. Um, I want to quickly talk on the issue of ransom. Uh, on the day of uh, the prisoner for cash deal, um, would the prisoners have been released in your assessment if the cash was not sent, the $400 million? Congressman, I cannot speak to that hypothetical situation. Uh, and I would make a point that this was not a prisoner for cash deal. These two issues uh, were settled. So, but you, so you don't know. You, you, they might not have been released had you not sent the cash. Is that a fair assessment? These two issues were settled based on their so, own so, merits. But my question is, I'm, I'm trying to get to the heart of this. Um, you can't tell me that you're guaranteed that our prisoners would have been released had your money not been sent. Right? And maybe to put it another way, um, if the prisoners hadn't been released, would have we sent the money? As I noted in my statement, Congressman, uh, specifically, after we learned that we could not locate the wife and mother of Jason Ruzayan, we put a pause on making this payment, not because it was linked to that particular transaction, but because it was a prudent Listen, step. So a prudent step, but you, the, the, you're, you're telling me that um, you wouldn't have sent the money but for the release of our prisoners. Yes? Is that a fair assessment? I, I cannot speak to what we would – had this deal not – come together at all in the following week. I cannot tell you that we would not have gone down that path. Exactly. And what which, I can which is, tell which is you. The point that is uh, most common sense Americans look at this and they say, hey, this was a payment of $400 million for the release of five prisoners, which in everyone's assessment uh, leads us to believe that, uh, as the chairman noted, uh, per Webster's Dictionary, is a ransom payment. Let's leave that aside. I'm sure my colleagues will get to that a little bit later. Out of the tribunal, there's been settlements uh, in the past uh, and have those, uh, have those settlements all been made in cash? Ms. Grosh? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, every single, so every my single experience settlement. has been that every single one of these settlements has been uh, sui generis. Uh, most of the settlements that were made in the past were uh, before sanctions. So and in fact, I, I, before... I, 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 only have, I only have two minutes. But to be clear, when we've had settlements, the payments to Iran have been made in cash payments, not wire transfers, not checks, not any other form. It's a cash payment, like what we did with the $1.7 billion. Is that I fair? am not aware that they ever have, but they have all been different and been done on their own merits. Some were done by checks. Some were done by wire transfers. Right. So that's my point. So this, this, this payment did not have to be made in cash. The payment could have been made uh, in the form that others were made, whether it was a check or a wire transfer. There, you were not prohibited from using a wire transfer or a check uh, you didn't have to send cash, is my point. Is that correct? 
Um, I, I can't really, you know, speak to that. I do know that Iran oh, was having very you, serious you, banking you, problems you, because you, of sanctions, and I think my colleague can speak used, more to you've that. You've used wire transfers and checks in the past, yes? Well, we've used checks in the past, checks but the past. to my okay. knowledge, che Treasury doesn't cut checks anymore. So uh, if the President says due to international sanctions against Iran, the payment uh, made in uh, euro and Swiss francs and other currencies had to be made in cash, you're telling me that, no, that's not true. We've actually made other forms of payment through the tribunal. Con uh, Congressman, I can right. speak to that. Uh, sure. These other payments were before uh, the period of the intense international sanctions that we had on Iran, those sanctions that we worked closely with this Congress to implement. So you put the handcuffs on yourself at the – I want to make a, a, a couple of quest, quick uh, questions. Did Iran request the money come in cash payment? The terms yes. of this deal for Iran were that they, they would get an immediate refund of the principal. For them, the critical need was that they got immediate access so that they could address the critical economic needs that they had. And at the time, our people so that were they, facilitating these transactions felt that so the only way to provide that immediate payment. So they didn't ask for cash, but you made sure method. that they got this money, the 400 and the 1.3 billion. They get immediate access to it. It's untraceable. And per media reports, this money has gone to the military, not for the benefit of the Iranian people. My time is up, and I uh, now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, the gentlelady from California, Ms. Waters, for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I'd like to thank our witnesses uh, for being here today. Um, but the first thing I want to say to our State Department witnesses is this. Um, much of what uh, happened around uh, this payment is classified information and I know that holding this hearing puts you in a position where you have to be very careful. And I don't wish you to be intimidated or wish you to make a mistake in trying to answer some of these questions because as I understand it, every member of Congress has been offered uh, to have classified briefings by the administration and they could have had any of their questions answered. So feel free uh, to resist any questions that will carry you into classified information, be very, very careful. Um, in addition to that, I, I simply want to say to our um, administration witnesses that I am concerned that this may be a part of the strategy that is being employed by my colleagues on the opposite side of the aisle to discredit the President of the United States of America. I am reminded that um, on the night of Barack Obama's inauguration, a group of top GOP luminaries quietly gathered in a Washington steakhouse to lick their wounds and ultimately create the outline of a plan for how to deal with the incoming administration. And that's a quote. Uh, and so it, it appears that this has been a continuing strategy that's being um, employed by um, members on the opposite side of the aisle, uh, again, in this attempt to discredit the president. I could ask you a lot of questions here today, uh, and I suppose a lot of questions will be asked of you about why pay them in cash, wasn't this basically ransom, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I'm not going to do that. Because any questions that I have, I'm going to take advantage of the classified hearings, uh, briefings rather, that are being offered to all of us to answer any of the questions that we may have. With that, if there's anything you'd like to share with us, uh, having been um, please do that at this time. I have no questions for you. Would you like to share anything with us? Uh, please do it at this, at this time. That's both of our State Department uh, representatives here. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. I think we've uh, laid out our remarks in our opening statements, but thank you. Uh, you're certainly welcome. Well, can you help to um, uh, clarify whether or not the members of Congress have been offered uh, classified briefings? Do you know about that? Yes, I, I'd be happy to clarify that. We have offered since January when, this, uh, when these uh, three lines of effort were concluded, we have offered uh, with respect to this particular 
piece, we have offered classified briefings uh, to all members in, 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 of Congress. Uh, we did have one such offer uh, accepted and we provided that briefing. Uh, we also offered, when this resurfaced recently, to have closed member and staff briefings. Uh, and we did have two days ago uh, staff briefings in both the House and Senate in a classified setting. Uh, would you please uh, uh, clarify how many members of this committee have taken advantage of that offer? Uh, Congresswoman, I'm afraid I'm not familiar with the one offer that was accepted, so it'd be hard for me to say, but as I mentioned, uh, there was one, one offer, one briefing provided, or one, one briefing uh, accepted, and we provided it. So are you saying there was a briefing where maybe several members of the committee came, or one member was briefed? It's my understanding that it was one member. Only one member? Was that member a member of this committee? Uh, no, he was not. So yeah. basically, it is correct if I... Uh, conclude that the offer was made, the staff have been briefed, but not one member of the committee, including myself, have taken advantage of that offer. So all of what will be asked here today could have been asked and they could have had access to classified information in that briefing. Is that correct? That is correct, uh, and the full details of this process are best described in a classified setting, given the various diplomatic and, and Is litigation. that offer still available to every member of this committee? Uh, absolutely. So today, they can only get information that's not classified, but if they're truly interested, they can get a classified briefing and get every question that they have answered. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you very much. I have no other questions. The gentle lady's time has expired. You uh, have it. The, the chair now recognizes uh, the former chair of uh, the, uh, uh, the Terrorism Financing Task Force and the vice chair of this committee, Mr. Fitzpatrick, from Pennsylvania for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Duffy, for, uh, for calling this really uh, critical hearing today. Mr. Bankmeyer, my, my first question is, uh, if Syed Abedini had not disclosed the existence of the second plane which contained the pallet of cash, would either Congress or the American people have ever learned of the existence? And the reason I ask is because I found out about uh, that fact probably the way most of my colleagues did because he spoke about it when he returned and we saw it on the news. So how was Congress ever going to find out about how that cash was delivered and why? Congressman, thank you for that question. I'm, I'm glad you raised it. Uh, we have said publicly and we continue to say that, that Mr. Abedini, what Mr. Abedini was told was incorrect. Uh, the delay in the departure of his flight uh, was due to a variety of complications uh, related, to the, related to the prisoner release deal, including... But it still happened. They, all occur, they occurred simultaneously in the end, did they not? The prisoner release deal was held up because we could not locate Jason Rosane's wife and mother. There were also some complications with respect to some of the Iranian nationals in the United States. It was just ironic it all happened the same night? Is that what you're as, saying? As, as I mentioned in my opening statement, we had a desire to conclude all of our lines of effort, the Iran nuclear deal, uh, the consular deal, and this Hague Tribunal Day deal all around, on or around the same time because we believe that there was significant diplomatic momentum uh, that allowed us to advance U.S. interests all at the same time. And we believe that there was a significant risk that if we allowed one or two of those to lag, uh, that we would not be able to achieve all of our core. Leaving aside for a moment the, the issue of the timing of the payment and the release of the hostages, this is a follow-up on Mr. Duffy's question. Who specifically made the decision uh, to make this payment in cash? Who at the State Department? Who at the Department of Justice? Who made that decision? I, I cannot speak to who made the decision to make it in cash. I, I, what I can tell you is that it was the determination of the people that had to facilitate this payment, that the way to provide who, a medium, who could tell us who made that payment. decision? If you can, you're here to testify this subcommittee or this committee. Who can tell us? Was, was it was it was it a was it a condition? Was it a condition of the Iranian government, or was it a decision of the United States Department of State? The condition of the deal was that there would be immediate payment. We knew that Iran had critical economic needs that it had to address immediately and that would not be addressed by the removal of the broader Iran, uh, Iran sanctions. Well, certainly there are other ways to make an immediate payment other than a, a middle of the night, what appears to be a drug drop. 
Congressman, the what are the what are the other ways we could have made an immediate payment? Congressman, I, I, I understand uh, your concerns about this, but what I will tell you is that the power of the sanctions that we had in place in Iran and that we still have in place, I'll remind that we have a full U.S. embargo on Iran that prohibits transfers of, of funds through the United States, uh, and there is a great reluctance by global financial institutions, sanctions aside, about doing these sorts of, uh, of business. And so we have seen difficulties with global banks being willing to engage in these particular transactions, and this was the way, this was the mechanism that we felt we could guarantee immediate payment. And that immediate payment was critical to getting the favorable settlement that we did. Had we not been able to perform on that obligation, we would have likely not gotten such a favorable settlement for the American people. Speaking of the, the favorable settlement, Mr. Bankman, I think you mentioned in your opening statement that you don't want to say anything here today that might compromise United States defenses to other remaining claims of the Islamic Republic of Iran? Was that, was that your opening statement? That's correct. If this is a joint comprehensive plan of action, if this was a comprehensive settlement, what are the other possible claims that Iran still has? We've made a payment of $1.7 billion in cash. Well, what are the other claims that they have that we did not settle as part of this joint comprehensive plan of action? I'll let my colleague respond to that, but let me just point out that the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action is a reference to the nuclear deal. It does not reference all of these lines of effort. So the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, uh, is the deal that we resolved comprehensively. The you, you said in your opening statement there are nuclear. other claims. Do you know what they are? Do, do you, it was your, your opening statement, sir. Do you know what those other claims are? There are, if you would like more detail, my colleague can provide it, but there are a variety of other claims related to foreign military sales. Let me move back sales. to the, the previous question about other ways that you could have made payment other than pallets of cash in the middle of the night. Um, how we conducted payments with other actors, such as North Korea, who are also cut off from the international financial system? We don't deliver cash. Congressman, I'm not familiar with any payments of that kind. I, I couldn't speak to that. I have nothing further. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Massachusetts, uh, Mr. Capuano, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank the panel. I don't really speak diplomatic. I, I have a trouble whenever I listen to people that are doing it. So I, gotta, I, I have to kind of clarify what I think I heard and what I think I know. I'm not really sure. Is there a difference between cash and a check? I, I, I guess people in the Treasury would know that. If somebody owes me money and they pay me cash or a check, does it matter? So there are a variety of ways, ways to effectuate a payment, uh, cash, check. It doesn't matter. Somebody owes me money, they pay me cash, they pay me check, they pay me transfer. They pay me in SNH green stamps if they still have them. It all counts, right? There, there are a variety of ways That's of making payment. I, I'd like to ask, I guess it would be the State Department people, regardless, if there was no hostages, no U.S. hostages, no Iranian prisoners, by the way, nobody wants to talk about the fact that we gave up Iranian prisoners as well. This was a prisoner swap in some ways. But if there weren't any, forget them. Would we have still had to pay this money? Uh, Congressman, uh, the State Department has been attempting, as I mentioned, for decades been discussing no, these I, FMS I, I, I'm claims. I'm not questioning your judgment on the settlement. Yes. I think the judgment, questioning a judgment on any settlement is a fair question. What I, questioning the Iran nuclear deal is a fair question. The question I have, once you made the decision to have a settlement, would we have paid this money whether there were hostages or not? Would we have paid this money to Iran at some point? It, it's clear to me that we reached a, a time when we were able to achieve a settlement and it's achieved. You're not answering. I, look, I, I'm trying to help. You don't want me to help? Don't, don't let me. Go ahead. Keep speaking. Very clear question. Forget the hostages. You made a deal at The Hague, which is in the Netherlands, not in Iran. I'm not questioning the deal. I'm saying, okay, you made a deal. Once the deal was made, would you have had to pay Iran the amount that you agreed to pay? Yes or no? Kind of simple. Yes, once the deal That's was what I made, thought. we would have had to. So the payment would have been made with or without hostages. And the hostages were a separate item agreed simultaneously. So it sounds to me like my friends on the other side who are all upset about this would rather we paid Iran the money and not gotten our people back, they would have been happy. Yay! Yippee! I wouldn't have been. And by the way, had you done that, you'd still be here being criticized for not getting Americans home. 
So you can't win this. I hope you understand this is a political game to try once again to, number one, trash the Obama administration, number two, trash the Iran nuclear deal, and number three, somehow make them look like criminals dropping bags of cash in the middle of the night like a drug deal. This is ridiculous. Now, I understand, and again, I think there are fair and reasonable and thoughtful and tough questions to ask about the Iran nuclear deal. I voted for it, but I think the questions are reasonable. Any legal settlement with the risk of litigation, I was a lawyer back in my previous life when I was actually had some useful function to have. Any legal settlement is question of negotiations, question of judgment. It's a judgment call. You're going to save money or make money, lose money. Fair question. Those are fair questions to say whether your judgment was right or wrong on this one. It's not fair to say we should have left four Americans in Iran. And if you had done that, let's assume you paid the money. Do you trust Iran to have lived up to their separate deal to let four Americans go? No, Congressman. In fact, as I mentioned, our biggest concern was this particular piece, that they would not I don't trust them either. And actually, it sounds like my friends on the other side trust them more than I do. It's awfully nice that you trust the Iranians. Good job. Great leadership. Great judgment. Of course we don't trust them. That's why the nuclear deal had the most invasive, aggressive inspection regime of any deal ever made in the history of this world. Again, I don't trust them. I'm glad the Americans are home. If this was a separate deal, cash for Americans, I'd be agreeing with my colleagues on the other side. Ransom is unacceptable. But payment, and by the way, whose money was this? Am I wrong to think that this was the money that we grabbed from Iran in 1980 to say everything's on hold? This is money you paid for a contract we're not giving it back until we negotiate, and we'll see you in The Hague. Is that right? It was their money. That's exactly right. So we gave them back their money in a form of legal tender that is now very public, and yet people are criticizing it because we got four Americans. Mother of God, thank you. Good job. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes uh, the chair of the full committee, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Henschling, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is clear that perhaps the administration and certain Democratic members of the House are the only people in America who believe that ransom was not paid. It is also clear that many believe this is a good U.S. policy. I believe it not to be a good U.S. policy. Otherwise, four hostages may lead to 40 hostages that may lead to 400 hostages. And that is why I believe in the history of our republic, it has not been the policy of the United States of America to pay ransom for hostages. The question I have, though, is again, it is most curious that this payment was made in cash. Now, some believe this is not a particularly relevant issue. According to the Financial Action Task Force, quote, the physical cross-border transportation of currency is one of the main methods used to move illicit funds, launder money, and finance terrorism, unquote. Cash is the currency of terrorism. We paid cash to the world's foremost state sponsor of terrorism. And the question is, again, why was that done? Was, it, was there a legal obligation? We've heard that some of these payments have been made in other methods that could be uh, more transparent through the normal financial channels. And the tribunal itself states it has finalized more than 3,900 cases. So I think one of our witnesses, Ms. Groch, did you not say that uh, at least some of these were not made in cash? Is that correct? 
Uh, Congressman, yes, there have been more than 39 cases resolved at the tribunal. The bulk of those payments came from a security account that Iran is obligated to ensure payment of all awards in favor of U.S. nationals and U.S. companies, and that is what resulted in $2.5 billion. Well, being let me paid ask you this question. Again, I'm having a little trouble figuring out why this was a cash payment. Isn't it true that under the Iranian transactions and sanctions regulations, there are exceptions to financial dealings that license payments between the American and, and American uh, and Iranian financial system in order to receive pay or settle claims pursuant to the United States Claims Tribunal, specifically 31 CFR Section 560.510. Yes, sir. That's the uh, general license I mentioned in my opening statement. Okay. So you didn't have to pay it in cash. But you did pay it in cash. It is, again, still unclear. The question has been asked, but it hasn't been answered. Specifically, did someone in the Iranian government ask for the cash payment? Can anybody on the panel answer the question besides a macro view that Iranians wanted money? Congressman, I'm trying to be specific. The term of the deal was that they got immediate payment. The reason for cash was not Are you aware of anybody of specifically the in the Iranian government asking for a cash payment? I'm not aware, nor am I aware of all the conversations that took place. Who would be aware? Who could this panel go to to get an answer to that simple question? Uh, we'd be happy to follow up with you on, on further details in a closed session, and we'd be happy to uh, discuss that with you in that setting. Are you aware that according to press reports, these funds have ended up in the hands of the Iranian military, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard? Congressman, I've seen those press reports. As I mentioned, we, it is our assessment that the vast majority of the funds that Iran has had access to, whether through the JCPOA or this, continue to be used for its economic needs. We have seen some press reports of an Iranian budget line item. Uh, our translators uh, and those in the intelligence community have... have well, that line item is roughly 10 percent of the entire uh, annual defense budget, the military budget of Iran. Does this administration not believe that giving the leading state sponsor of terrorism $400 million in cash, followed by $1.3 billion, does that not present any serious terrorist financing concerns to you at all? Congressman, we have made clear from the very beginning that the deals that we struck on this day do not resolve all of our concerns with Iran, and those concerns remain significant. What we resolved was the most imminent and critical, which was the nuclear program. And we were able to resolve two additional pieces of business at the same time. But we still oppose and object to Iran's destabilizing activities in the region, its support for terrorism. And time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And we continue to counter those activities through the, uh, through the very uh, vigorous tools that we have. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, uh, Mr. Cleaver, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in, in January, I will have been on this committee for 12 years, um, assuming I, I'm reelected. Um, and and so I'm, I'm always very, uh, you know, careful, not just here, I'm uh, careful everywhere, because uh, I do think words matter, uh, which is why I, I would not allow my uh, three-year-old granddaughter to uh, to watch the news, uh, and so I, I can't tell you how disturbed uh, I am. I'm, I'm often disturbed. I'm going I'm to start saying things uh, uh, when this happens on, on both sides. Uh, but I, I think um, uh, one of my my colleague, who is a, a good guy, I know him. I've been to his home and um, met his family. But when you Drop a, a word like a words like, you know, a drug drop. Um, that creates some discomfort, um, and I I know that the gentleman didn't mean what could be interpreted. Um, 
to be really awful. Um, and um, I, I, it would be my hope that, you know, that it was, you know, a misstatement. And, and or, or sometimes we all say things we, we would rather pull back. I, I'm assuming that he would rather pull that back um, because there are a lot of people. Um, I mean, this could mushroom into, into something that I think would be embarrassment, an embarrassment to the entire committee. Um, and you say, you talk, I mean, we're talking about this three-hour strategizing meeting. Fast forward to this hearing, and we're saying, you know, it was like a drug drop. That's, a, that's not good. That's, that's, that's a little scary. And my partisanship doesn't, or my, or my uh, ideo ideological leanings have to stop at, uh, at some point. Um, you know, which is, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that George Bush, you know, had a drug drop or, uh, or um, hopefully anybody. Um, so I, I'm, you know, that this is maybe a political gathering and, and we're supposed to do uh, some of this stuff. I can't do it because uh, I just, I, I think we're, the whole country is looking at this political process and saying, you know, Washington stinks. And we're creating a higher level of stinktivity. Uh, yeah, that's a word, I'm, I made it up. Uh, when we do this kind of thing, we're stinking up the political process. And I don't, I, I mean, I, you know, I have some questions, but I, you know, uh, after that, I just decided I, I got good questions. As uh, Mr. Trump would say, these are very good questions, big questions. But uh, after that, I, I, I don't want to engage in this. Um, so I would like to uh, just uh, yield back the rest would of you, my time. Would you yield to me, Mr. Cleaver? Mr. Cleaver, would you yield to me? Yes, I would. Thank you, Mr. Cleaver, and thank you for your thoughtfulness. A couple of points to be made. Um, we hear people bemoaning the money that was give, accorded the Iranians. But there have been settlements that have inured to the benefit of Americans totaling about $2.5 billion. So would we give back the $2.5 billion that have been accorded Americans in settlements? Not a lot of emphasis is being placed on the fact that people came home. Thank you, Mr. Capriano. People came home. Americans were freed. Would you send them back? Would you put them back into harm's way, incarcerated in Iran? Is that what you're, is that what you're pushing today? This hearing is about headlines, not headway. Headway could be made by doing as the Honorable Maxine Waters has indicated, Classified briefings are available to all of us, and we can make headway. But today, it's about headlines. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Mulvaney, for five minutes. Thank the gentleman. A couple of random questions. First of all, I want to follow up on something that I think Mr. Hensling started to ask. I don't know if he asked it this way. Uh, the cash payment is in violation of law, isn't it? Cash payment violates uh, 31 CFR 208.3. Is that true? So the, uh, the the payment was done consistent with with all of the appropriate Treasury regulations. Okay, I'm reading 208.3, payment by electronics fund transfer. Subject to 208.4, which is a waiver, which I don't think is relevant here because it deals with checks. And notwithstanding any other provision of law, effective January 2, 1999, all federal payments made by any agency shall be made by electronic funds transfer. Didn't this transfer of cash, at least the $400 million in cash, a hard currency, doesn't that violate 208.3? Sir, if I could just for a moment um, walk through the flow of these transactions. They generally flowed in the same manner. Um, so we'll take the, the $400 million principal payment. Do it quickly, um, please. I only have five minutes. Generally speaking, that, that payment was transferred by, by a wire transfer. It was transferred to the account of a Foreign Central Bank. That foreign central bank then converted it into foreign currency banknotes and dispersed it to the, 
the government of Iran. Uh, Treasury's regulations speak to that, that, that payment um, to the, the payee of the, of the claim, not necessarily to the ultimate payment of the claimant, which so in guess, this case was the government. I guess the, the government. short answer is since the wire transfer went to an escrow agent, the escrow agent paid out the cash, you didn't violate 208.3. Is that, is that the, the basic argument? This was consistent with Treasury's regulations, sir. Okay. Why do we pay interest? My understanding is that the FMS trust fund does not bear interest. Uh, Congressman, yes, that's correct. In a typical situation, customers pay their funds into the trust fund, and by law, that trust fund does not accrue interest. As I mentioned in the top of my remarks, uh, the United States and Iran entered into a memorandum of understanding in February of 1979 that had express provision for unexpended funds to be placed in an interest-bearing account, and it's on that uh, based on that language that Iran has brought its claim for interest. Okay, did we put it in an interest-bearing account? The funds were not placed in an interest-bearing account. So we had an agreement with Iran that required us to put that money into an interest-bearing account, but we didn't do that? As a, as a factual matter, that is correct. I, I could have a lot more to say about that, but these, some of these matters are still other issues related to that um, memorandum of understanding are currently being litigated between the parties. So I guess I'd be happy to discuss that further in a closed setting. So either the Carter administration or the Reagan administration or both had followed the MOU, the interest would have been paid by the bank into which we put the escrow account, the escrow monies. All administrations since uh, the Memorandum of Understanding in 1979 uh, acted consistently with respect to these funds. No, you just told me they didn't. It said that the MOU required us to put it in an interest-bearing account, and then you, in the next sentence said that we didn't do that. that. That's correct, but what I was saying was that, that each administration treated those funds consistently, uh, notwithstanding the language of the MOU. There are legal arguments at stake here that continue to be before the tribunal, and again, I would be happy to I discuss that further in a closed setting. All right, we may get that opportunity. Last question um, to Mr. Capuano. I think he stepped out. Uh, my understanding of the flow of the funds is that the original $400 million, which is in the FMS, was indeed a payment by the government of Iran under the FMS program. I get that. Okay? Their money, for lack of a better word. But there was a legal lien against that money, wasn't there? that uh, the 2000 uh, Victims of Trafficking Violence Protection Act of 2000 specifically placed a lien against that exact amount of money. Is that not true? Well, if you're talking about a judicial lien, that is not true. No, I'm talking, about a, I'm talking about a public law, 106-38. I don't have the U.S. Code in front of me. I've got, the, I got 106 386 and it says that uh, judgments against Iran for purposes of funding payments under Section A, we we're trying to make sure that victims of terrorism got paid, in case of the judgments against Iran, the Secretary of Treasury shall make such payments from amounts paid and liquidated from, and there's a list of things. One of the list includes funds not otherwise made available in an amount not to exceed the total amount in the Iran Foreign Military Sales Program account. This money was leaned by law in 2000. Yes, I'm familiar with that, uh, Congressman. So what, did we repeal what, this law, or how did we get around this? What happened was that the judgments were paid from uh, appropriated funds to the extent of $400 million, which was the balance of the FMS trust fund at that time, at the time of enactment. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So the taxpayers paid $400 million in claims when we could have taken it out of this fund? Yes, it's correct. Congress passed legislation that appropriated funds to be paid to those victims to the level of what was in the balance of the trust fund. When did we do that? Through the, the very act that you're discussing. Okay, the very act that I'm discussing doesn't say that, though. The very act says that for purposes of funding payments, we go to the FMS trust fund. Yes, I'm, and I'm if you section if you, 2002 subsection 2B. Right, and and if you look at that act, it also provides that the United States shall be fully subrogated to the extent of the payments. Subrogation means that the United States made those payments. I'm aware of like what subrogation means. Yeah, so the United States was subrogated to those claims. What that means is those claims then become the the U.S. government claims. So they're not. To Mr. Capuano's piece, at the end of that, after the subrogation, they are not Iran's funds anymore. They have the United States government funds, aren't they? No. The funds have remained in the, United, in the trust fund as Iranian uh, money is in the trust fund. The United States, Congress appropriated $400 million to be paid to these individuals. Instead of taking the money out of the, out of the, out of the FMS trust fund. That's but correct. by doing so, we thus own the $400 million. No, that's incorrect. I'm sorry. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Delaney, four or five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
did the four hundred million dollars actually sit in an account segregated at a, at a separate financial institution, or was it just held by the United States government? The four hundred million dollars is in what is called the FMS trust fund that sits in the Treasury. All FMS customers pay funds into there, and then they are separated through separate holding accounts for each customer. But but is it is it kind of fungible cash, or is it actually segregated in a separate account? I mean, when you say it's held at the Treasury, does that mean it's effectively fungible with all the cash of the United States and it's just tracked as a separate account, or is there actually somewhere the equivalent of a bank account at a large financial institution where there's a statement that says there's 400 million of cash sitting in there? I, I believe my colleagues at the Treasury could maybe speak to this more, but my understanding is that it is an account within the U.S. Treasury. Okay. So it seems like what effectively happened in the middle of 2015 is three things came together simultaneously. The, the, the Iran nuclear agreement, the prisoner exchange swap, and then the settlement of this claim. Is that the right way of thinking about it? Three separate transactions or three separate agreements were reached by three separate teams? Congressman, that's correct. We sought to finalize all of those issues on the same or on around the same time to take advantage of the diplomatic momentum we so have. So as it relates to this claim, is it fair to say that a legal obligation of the United States of America was created in mid-2015 to pay $1.7 billion? I, I wouldn't put it exactly that way. These are matters that were under litigation for many years and uh, – Members of the Legal Advisor's Office at the State Department had been looking, had been litigating these FMS claims right. for a long but time. But I'm talking about, fast, forget about all the history. In, in the middle of 2015, it, you said this was settled. It, it wasn't settled. What we were facing was we were approaching a hearing date. Right. And Iran wanted to move to, it's like going to trial, and they mm -hmm. wanted to have this decision not only go to hearing right. and heard by the tribunal, but decided in a preliminary manner. And what interest rate were they claiming was owed across the period of time? Uh, Iran was claiming very, very high interest rates. What rate? Um, this is an area that I would prefer not to get into in this. It looks setting. like we settled at a slightly higher than a 4 percent interest rate. Is that right? I, I, I don't know exactly what that translates okay. into. There was certainly a methodology behind that, and I'd be happy to go through that um, in a closed setting. Right. And do you, know the, do you know what the average interest rate, treasury rate across the period of time was? I, I do know that in the early 1970s and 1980s, the interest rates were around 18, 19, 20 percent. Right, they were high. I mean, just, and I haven't done the exact math, but just looking at the chart, it looks like the average Fed rate across the period of time was about 8 percent, and you settled for about 4, and the power of compounding is such that at 8 percent, it would have been 8 or $9 billion, and at 4 percent, it was a billion three. So that's the bargain you thought you negotiated. Is that correct? We agreed to the disposition and a, and a compromise on interest. That's right. And so was it actually a legal obligation, would you say? I mean, if the, you, you say you agreed and you settled, but was there any kind of formal agreement that was reached where somewhere in the books of the United States of America we entered a $1.7 billion liability? I'm not sure I understand the question, but um, we certainly – So if someone would have asked the government in the fall of 2015, how much do we owe Iran? Would they have said $1.7 billion or would they have said $400 million? Again, this is, um, as was referred to by one of your colleagues, this is a matter of litigation risk, and these are the kinds of issues we look at like any litigating parties when you are actively litigating claims. We could discuss that – some of that litigation so, risk in a closed setting. So I guess the question, was this settled in mid-2015 or was it still open-ended? In mid-2015, we were uh, discussing this with Iran and we were – we there was some urgency because we felt that this was going to go to hearing and then a decision by the tribunal. Were you but still discussing it in September of 2015? Yes. In December of 2015? Yes. Iran filed its hearing proposal in November of 2015. What day do we think we actually agreed to the $1.7 billion, like that number? Are you speaking to the United States yes. or to Iran? Yes. Yeah, when do we feel like we had an agreement with them as to $1.7 billion? Again, I think it would be better to discuss those details in a closed setting. Because that date is relevant as to whether this was an obligation of the government or something else. And that – but I assume what you're, say, what you're saying here today is that that agreement for $1.7 billion was reached before the payment was made. That is correct. How much in advance of the payment, would you say? 
Uh, again, on issues of timing, we certainly had um, agreed with Iran sometime before the payment was made. I wasn't involved in all does, the details. Does sometime mean more than 30 days or more than 60 days or more than 90 days? Uh, it, was, it was less than 30 days. Okay. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentle lady from Missouri, Ms. Wagner, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to our panel for appearing today to answer questions uh, for us, but more importantly, to answer questions for the American people and shed some light, some transparency on what actually happened with this money transfer to Iran. Unmarked cash in foreign currencies strapped on wooden pallets and loaded onto a cargo airplane to be sent to a recognized state sponsor of terror. It seems more like a scene out of a made-for-TV movie than actual real-life U.S. policy. And as an Army mom whose son is an active duty infantry officer and is a former United States ambassador, I just have to say I am very concerned with the appearance of our government paying ransoms for captured prisoners and further in future endangering our other soldiers and diplomats abroad. I'd like to reference, uh, I'd like to reference a quote from White House Press Secretary Josh, uh, Josh Ernst from earlier August as to why the U.S. made this settlement payment so quickly, to which he said the Iranians, and I quote, we're eager to try to address the legitimate concerns of the Iranian people about the state of the Iranian economy. Is it the opinion of the State Department or the Treasury Department that this money transfer would be used for the Iranian economy? Mr. Beckler. Uh, Congresswoman, first let me say uh, thank you for the service of your son and thank you for your service. Uh, we spend our days at the State Department, I know, as well as the Treasury and the Justice Department, uh, doing our best to advance the U.S. interests and doing our best to protect our men and women overseas, and we are grateful for their service. Um, with, respect to your, uh, with respect to your question, um, this was a situation, as I said, where the timing was, uh, was related to the various pieces of business that we were trying to get done. All Did you believe that it was going to help the Iranian economy, either state or treasury? As I said, it is our assessment that the vast majority of the funds that they've received have What been assurances going were you giving, sir? Even if I had gotten assurances from the Iranians, you would not believe those assurances, nor would I. Precisely. Why, Let me move I on. Said, I, I'm reclaiming my time. I have a, short, a lot of questions in a short amount of time. We have since seen that Iran's latest year budget provides for an additional, guess what, $1.7 billion, the same amount transferred by this administration to the military establishment to spend as it wishes in Iran. Ms. Grosh, why did the White House think that this money would be used for the economy when Iran ended up using it for their military? Congresswoman, I'm uh, sorry, I'm, that's way out of my league, and I'm, that, I'm not in a position to decide that. My expertise really involves uh, litigation of these claims at the tribunal and uh, determining a settlement. Well, let me ask a more relevant question. How do we know that this $1.7 billion increase did not come as a direct result of the cash transfer from the U.S.? Congresswoman, the press report that you're referring to is one that we have reviewed and had our, our Persian translators review, and we believe that it is inaccurate. National Security Advisor Susan Rice recently admitted that some of the $150 billion that Iran will receive in sanctions relief from the Iran nuclear agreement would, quote, support international terrorism. Mr. Beckmeyer, what assurances do we have that this settlement money will not end up funding terror proxies, units like Hezbollah, considering that they receive support from the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps? As I've mentioned, Congresswoman, we have ser serious concerns with Iran's problematic behaviors, including those that you've just referenced, their support for terrorism, their support for proxy groups. We have a variety of tools that we use to counter those activities. Well, let's talk about those. Does paying sanctions. Iran in all cash make it more riskier than the money could end up in supporting terrorism? Congressman, I can't speak to the risk on that, but what I can say is that, the, that this settlement was made based on its own merits. Well, if this settlement, let's say, funding does in fact end up promoting terrorism, what actions could the U.S. take to punish Iran for its behavior? 
we have a variety of tools through sanctions, through other, uh, through other means that we can use to, uh, to uh, enforce our sanctions against Iran. These include authorities that go against individuals and entities like the IRGC, the Quds Force, and those that are involved in terrorism. That includes activities that are operational in nature that we use. I'm running out of time. What, uh, Ms. Grosch, what incentive or gain did the U.S. receive in return for structuring the payment so favorably in the cash to Iran? I'm not aware. I know that this settlement was in the interest of the United States. Mr. Ahern, did Iran insist that the settlement money be delivered in cash? We're going to try one more time at this. Ma'am, I wasn't part of the negotiations. I can't speak to that. What I can say is that my understanding is that settling this claim well, when at was this it time agreed upon in this that manner it would be cash? saved the United States government potentially from paying billions of dollars more to Iran. My, my time has expired. I, I appreciate the indulgence of, of the chair. I have many more questions, and I will submit them for the record. Thank you, Mr. The Chairman. The gentlelady's time has expired. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Ohio, Ms. Beatty, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our ranking member. And uh, a big thank you uh, to our witnesses who are here today. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just have a, a few brief statements, and more so for clarification for me and for all of those uh, who are watching this. Um, so let me start by thanking you for advising us that to get the real answers that we need if we want it to move forward, then our leadership and others, including myself, had I known about it, would be doing this in a classified briefing. That's number one. We are often chastised on this side of Al if we're a little late for complying with some rules. And so I'm going to assume, since it's my understanding that the title of today's hearing is picked by the majority, and the title is Fueling Terror, the Dangers of Ransom Payments to Iran. So if they really thought that this was a problem, seem like you'd want to be more armed by being in a classified setting where you could get real information. If you don't want real information and you just want to showboat, then you do or you get what we're seeing here today. There's been a, a lot of uh, opening statements in your opening statements. Well, let's go back to the opening statement that our chairman uh, made of the financial services, uh, the, the chairman mentioned, uh, when he said it was the Iranian officials who said this was really in a ransom. Now, our president, that's, I'm not saying my president, let's get something clear. The president of the United States is our president. So our president is telling us that it was not. He was trying to save lives and bring them back home. So let's figure out who the real enemy is here. If I'm sitting here listening to this as many Americans are, it almost seems like my colleagues are pitting our president against the individuals that they are now chastising us for, for bringing our individuals home. So we have been intense in here. Uh, we have been somewhat humorous in here. So let me be very abstract in here. Since this has been a lot about money, let's just say I wanted to say, since they're expecting you after you have actually said in one of your statements that you thought the money went for economic needs, but yet you keep being badgered over the cash and badgered over where the dollars are going, and more specifically, that they're going to fund terrorism. So what if I would say to my colleagues, there's something called the RNC, and monies that they give go into the RNC. So would they remember or know if their monies to the RNC that went to the presidential candidate, Donald Trump, who I believe excites terrorism, would they be able to then say back to me why they did? Let's assume most of them didn't give to him. Interesting, isn't it? But we know their dollars will go in to fund a presidential candidate who excites terrorism a presidential candidate who's not about saving lives, who makes fun of those who are disabled, who degrades women, and yet they stand here wanting to question our president for going back and giving the money that belonged to them already. It was their money. 
He gave them back. Now, I also think you would use words like, it was incredibly brilliant that our president cared so much about those individuals who were being held there that he wanted to do one thing. And if he's guilty of something, it was to make sure that the timing of the transaction, it was already done that he was giving the money. That wasn't a secret. We knew he was giving it. We even know how they lined up the foreign currency to be put on the pallets to give to them. So that's not a secret. If you're trying to do something that is not legal or fair, you don't publicize and describe it and you say it. So it was the timing that he wanted to do to make sure that people were returned safely. So I want to thank you for trying to be helpful. I want to thank you for your answers. But I think you said it best when you said, you're not there knowing how the dollars are trans, how the dollars are transferred or what we did, but you do believe it went for economic needs. Thank you, and I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman uh, from California and the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, Mr. Royce for five minutes. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The reason we're concerned with cash going to Iran, especially $1.7 billion in cash, is because Iran is in the process with the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps of funding terrorism in the region. And specifically what they're trying to do is get their hard, hands on hard currency. So when they're trying to develop, for example, for Hezbollah, the capability to use GPS in order to uh, be able to equip the missiles and rockets in the inventory with this uh, special capability to be able to hit the tallest buildings in Tel Aviv or be able to uh, get around the Iron Dome. This, this needs two things. The transfer of the missiles from Iran to Hezbollah, they already have transferred 100,000 of these rockets and missiles. And second, it needs the capability of being able to switch this over to this GPS capability. For that kind of terrorism, they need hard currency. That's why we're interested in the 1.7 billion cash payment. Because by insisting that it was the only way to get the money to Iran, we are strict in maintaining banking, sections, uh, uh, banking uh, sanctions. This is hugely misleading, and let me explain why. The sanction system was designed with tribunal payments in mind. The Iran transaction sanctions regime contains a number of exemptions from the rule so that certain transactions can go forward. And in this case, transactions for tribunal settlements are explicitly authorized and would shield any entity involved in such a transaction from liability under U.S. law if this had been done the proper way without use of cash. No, it was the Iranians that wanted the cash. They wanted the cash because they're trying to fund terror. That's what the IRGC does. It is the number one state sponsor of terrorism in the world today. So the administration chose not to license a transaction within the international financial system. They chose to deliver $1.7 in untraceable assets, which was the demand on the part of Iran. And if everything was on the up and up and there is no connection to hostages, why not go through the process laid out in law? This is a state sponsor of terrorism. So. You're right that banks don't want to do business with a country that is backing the slaughter of hundreds of thousands of innocents and those in Syria and developing missiles, ballistic missiles, by the way, aimed at us because they're intercontinental ballistic missiles. But the truth of the matter is that if you wanted to pay through a bank, you could have. The primary example here is North Korea and Banco Delta Asia. No one was more toxic than North Korea and the BDA. Not even Iran today, but when the last administration wanted to get North Korea, wanted to give the funds back to North Korea, it found a way using the New York Fed and the Russian Central Bank. It found a way through legitimate financial channels, which you certainly could have done. Likewise, you found a way during the interim agreement to facilitate 700 million back to Iran each month through international banking relationships. Yes, it would have taken longer, but the dispute this payment was supposed to settle was over 35 years old. What's a couple more months? 
The only way that I see timing coming into play, if this was a ransom for the release of Americans, and if this didn't drive the capture of three more Americans, and remember, that's what the Department of Justice said at the time, don't do this, it'll be perceived as ransom and we'll have more Americans uh, captured. The, set, the heavy water payment, another 10 million. Now, now that's not much compared to the 1.7 billion, but with, was this paid in cash too? I'd certainly like to know, because the danger I see here is that cash is going to become the new normal for the, for the Iranians. And lastly, I just bring up, pursuant to the victims of trafficking, and Violence Protection Act in 2000, 400 million in taxpayers' dollars was supposed to go to U.S. citizens to settle judgments against Iran for terrorist attacks. It looks to me like part of this understanding is, is letting Iran off the hook for those terrorism claims that was part of that settlement. Is that correct? With respect to the victims of terrorism claims, as I was speaking, as I answered one of your colleagues' questions, uh, those judgments were paid in 2000 with the Victims of Trafficking Act. Uh, Congress appropriated $400 million to pay them, so their judgments were paid. But what about those, the interest on that that should have come those, out of this account? Those claims were then subrogated to the United States, so they became U.S. government claims, and they were factored into the overall settlement. And in terms of my question, on the situation of how this was handled with North Korea? Why was it not handled the same way with respect to Iran? Congressman, I am not familiar with North Korea, uh, but what I can tell you is this. We share your concerns with respect to Iran's troubling activities. We have a variety of tools that we use to counter those activities, including robust sanctions, uh, including sanctions that continue with respect to Hezbollah in, 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 in legislation that was passed in this, uh, in this body. Uh, we continue to use those and intend to aggressively enforce those as we go forward. With respect to the, the mechanism of the payment, uh, all I can say is that Iran did not, regardless of the, of the legal, uh, uh, legal uh, prohibitions, Iran did not have the international relationships, did not have the accounts because of the sanctions that were so strongly imposed by this Congress. Uh, there were not, accounts were not allowed during the sanction period, and as a result, Iran did not have those relationships. So it was difficult to do anything else in an immediate way, and the immediate payment of these funds is what uh, allowed us to get favorable terms that were in the in interest of the United States. The, the, the immediate payment is what it managed to coincide with the exact the time has exchange expired. for our uh, four hostages. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Heck, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this question is for either... Mr. Backmeyer, Ms. Gresh, my understanding is that the most recent settlement at the Hague Tribunal before January 2016 was in 1991, when Washington and Tehran agreed to a $278 million payment as compensation for military equipment that the Shah paid for but was undelivered at the time of the revolution. The final negotiations on that settlement coincided with the release, as you will recall, of two Western hostages, including one American by Iranian-backed Shiite Muslim militants over in Lebanon. According to a New York Times article dated November 28, 1991, Bush administration officials at the time denied that the deal was linked in any way to the fate of the hostages in Lebanon. The State Department's legal advisor then as now, under President Bush, said in the Times that with respect to the arms deal, quote, it's pure coincidence that it's coming together at the same time the hostages are being released. In your view, is there any reason to doubt the Bush administration's claim that the hostages release had anything to do with the arms deal settlement, which they claim had been under discussion for a long time? Uh, Congressman, um, I am familiar with those. Uh, I recall those reports at the time. I wasn't involved in that particular settlement. But our practice is that we, in looking at all of these cases, we assess litigation risk and we decide these settlements on their own merit. I will take that as there's no reason to have doubted the Bush administration's claim. I would ask you if you rec recall any public outcry at the time over that. Fact was, there was none from Congress. Uh, I'll save you the time. I would also ask you if you recall uh, any hearings being held by any relevant committee of jurisdiction regarding that issue, as we are today. I'll save you the time. There were none. And I will also remind you 
that in the wake of the original Iranian hostage crisis uh, back in 1981, we in fact signed a deal to transfer nearly $8 billion, a transfer which was authorized by incoming President Reagan. And once again, there were no congressional hearings on the legality of that, nor an indication from the members of the then majority party, as now, that it constituted a ransom. So one of my favorite expressions is, consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds. Congratulations, evidently there are no small minds here today because there certainly isn't a lot of consistency. You know, ordinarily we have hearings often on subjects which I don't agree with or with such incendiary titles as is today's hearing. But I almost always find a way to thank the chair because I think it at least unlocks the door or opens the door for a constructive dialogue and questions and answers that can help illuminate. That's not the case today. There's no legitimate reason to be holding this discussion other than to dissemble the facts and to engage in propaganda. None whatsoever. Indeed, the only thing I want to say and not further legitimize this hearing is that for the four of you and your colleagues, however directly or indirectly you were involved in the return of those four Americans, you have our thanks. I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chair. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Tipton, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Grosh, what is the policy of the United States when it comes to ransom for uh, putting out payment for ho hostages? Uh, Congressman, um, my understanding is stated by the President that it is uh, the United States government's policy not to pay ransom. You don't pay ransom. Uh, Mr. Backmeyer, you would made the comment that uh, there was a desire to be able to conclude all of our lines of effort. Uh, when the payments were made of uh, ultimately $1.7 billion cash sitting on pallets going in the middle of the night to Iran. Uh, were the hostages part of that line of uh, efforts that you're talking about? Congressman, as I described, there were more multiple lines of effort. There was the implementation of the nuclear deal that we so were was there a tie between the cash and the hostage release? There was not a tie between the cash and the hostage release. The How does that tie, go back to your comment that it was all of the lines being tied together to be able to achieve the end? Uh, I don't believe I said the lines tied together. I, sir, I believe what I was trying to convey was that we thought we had a unique opportunity uh, and diplomatic momentum where we could achieve multiple U.S. objectives, including implementing a nuclear deal that extended the bronze breakout timeline from less than 90 days to over a year, including bringing home American citizens that have been unjustly detained and, and arrested on bogus and trumped so up there charges. there was a tie. And settling uh, a long-time outstanding claim that we would have paid one way or another. So this was not a question uh, with respect to the Hague, cl Hague claim tribunal uh, or Hague tribunal claim of whether to pay $1.7 billion or zero. It was a question of whether to pay so $1.7 the, $1. billion or much It was more. a tie with no connection. But I, I, I would like to be able to get into the terrorism end of this. Uh, in terms of the agreements that were put forward, Ms. Grosh, uh, during the negotiations for the settlement uh, purposes of the agreement with Iran and payments, uh, did anyone in the administration uh, ever bring up uh, the issue, could these funds be used for terrorism? Was that raised as a concern? Um, again, my, my expertise in all of this is very narrow. It really is to uh, litigating claims, assessing litigation risk. And in any of these settlements, whether it's this one or the ones that we've entered into prior to give advice about what's a good settlement Mr. for Backmire, the United States government. Mr. Backmire, can you answer that? Were any concerns raised by the administration? Congressman, I said we have multiple concerns with the Iranian government and multiple concerns with their activities. What overrode those concerns? Congressman, as I've noted, we have uh, take, tried to take step by step uh, on multiple lines of effort areas where we think we can advance U.S. interests. Uh, we do so in a concerted and thoughtful way, and we have done that with respect to the most immediate threat, which is the Iranian nuclear program. We have done that with respect to one of our top priorities of bringing home our American citizens. And with respect to this claim, we did so in a way that saved taxpayer dollars. We are obviously concerned okay, you, about you, You're talking potential. about ta uh, saving the taxpayer dollars. Uh, you know, if we look at uh, National Security Advisor Su Susan Rice, she admitted 
that some of the Iranian money could be used for terrorism. Uh, is that a concern that you took into consideration? We are constantly concerned with what Iran might do with respect to its support for terrorism, and we have a variety of tools that we use to counter that. That includes robust sanctions that were passed in this very House. That includes designations of individual entities like the IRGC, the Quds Force, other entities in Iran that support terrorism. We have a robust intelligence I'd like, I'd like to, uh, Mr. Bakhmar, maybe you could give me a little bit of clarity on this. Uh, the $1.7 uh, billion dollar settlement uh, where you sent over cash in the middle of the night on pallets to Iran that went into their possession. Uh, you've said that the majority of this has gone to infrastructure programs, so we're left assuming that they're filling potholes over there. Since you were able to track that money, uh, what happened to the rest of it? Did a little bit of it go to terrorism uh, funding? Uh, you were able to track the infrastructure program. Sir, what I'm, what I'm speaking to is our assessment of the vast majority of funds that Iran has, has gotten access to with respect to the multiple F lines of effort that we have. Uh, I cannot get into specific details about where any of those are going, as I can speak in a general matter, uh, but it does not change the fact that we have serious concerns about what Iran does do with its money, and we, we have We're talking a lot about in a general matter, it's going to infrastructure. Uh, where would the other money go to? Uh, Congressman, I don't think I said infrastructure. I believe I, I – no, I think you did. You said infrastructure programs. Uh, I believe I, – if I did, I, I – what I recall saying was it was going to domestic economic needs, but I have made the point again and again that we have concerns about where Iran does send its money and its support, and we have a variety of tools that are in place uh, in order to uh, try to counter that. That is an ongoing effort of our government. Did they give you any guarantees that the money wouldn't be used for terrorism? Uh, I'm not aware of any guarantees, uh, but – our, the way we approach this is from what the U.S. government can do with respect to our intelligence capabilities, with respect to our operational capabilities, and with respect to our diplomatic capabilities to try to, to track and deter those sorts of activities. We, we have a vigorous effort to both deter and disrupt shipments to Hezbollah, other proxies in the region. Uh, that is an active effort that is ongoing. We have active efforts with respect to our sanctions, uh, which is intended to degrade the potential for those actors. Uh, and we have as you know, ultimately, ultimately, other diplomatic lines of effort where we are trying to resolve other issues of concern and other threats to the United States. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Kildee, for five minutes. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. And to you and the ranking member, thank you for, uh, for agreeing to my participation. I'm not on the subcommittee, but I'm here because there's probably not a subject since uh, I've been in Congress for the last four years that I've spent more time on than the issue of uh, the U.S. relationship with Iran, specifically because one of those Americans that people continue to refer to is a young man who lives about a mile from me now, a young man named Amir Hikmati from Flint, Michigan, my hometown, uh, who gratefully, thankfully, as a result of the great work of the agencies represented here, our Secretary of State, President of the United States, is now a free man at home pursuing the rest of his life. The reason I, I make that point is that there were very many members of Congress, including some members who have expressed their outrage today in this hearing, based on their assumption that there was some connection between these three distinct negotiations that took place, that one was a quid pro quo for the other. There were many members of the House of Representatives who took time at the point that the JCPOA was enacted, agreed to, that the release of these Americans should have been a part of that transaction and that it wasn't. So I have a bit of concern with what I see as some uh, duplicity here, that on one hand, when it fits the political narrative, the administration is criticized for not making these separate negotiations all combined into one, and when it fits the political narrative a month or two before a presidential election, suddenly we're criticizing the fact that they assume that they were. Well, they can't have it both ways. So, you know, this does not make these negotiations, these agreements do not make, does not make Iran a, um, a good player on the global stage. There are still a lot of unresolved issues. Certainly. Uh, some regarding their terrorist activities or their support of terrorist activities fits that category. The fact that we still haven't had information about the status of Robert Levinson is another 
cause of great concern. Many of us continue to press Iran for information regarding his status. But to hear the same voices say that the release of these Americans should have been part of these separate negotiations, now say that they were a part, coming out of the same voices, makes it obvious that what's going on here is simply politics. Sadly, especially when we consider the gravity of not just the relationship between the U.S. and Iran and Iran and the rest of the world, particularly in that region, but to bring in the release, the happy release of these Americans um, into that conversation, I think, is unfortunate. So let me, just, let me just ask, at what point since 1979 uh, did the United States have any direct negotiations with Iran? Was there any point in time before uh, President Obama and President Rouhani spoke by telephone uh, during the General Assembly? Was there any direct negotiations, face-to-face -face negotiations, uh, officially between the United States and Iran, between the revolution and that moment in 2013? Um. Congressman, I wouldn't want to speak to the entire history, but let me summarize, and I think we'll answer your question. Uh, diplomatic contact was basically cut off for that entire period. I guess the better way to put it, was there ever an opportunity that presented itself to resolve these long-standing disputes through direct negotiation, whether it is the release of the Americans or this dispute that resulted in the payment that's the subject of this hearing? Was there a moment that occurred prior to the JCPOA uh, uh, negotiations that took place that allowed for another track of negotiations to occur simultaneously? Well, with respect to the Hague Tribunal, as my colleague has noted, we have had ongoing conversations in that tribunal to settle claims. But with respect to the consular issues that you raised that we do agree are so important, uh, our first real tangible opportunity to raise those was in the context of the JCPOA, and we took every opportunity in those negotiations, as you note, uh, to raise these particular cases. And it was that channel that allowed us to continue discussions uh, on their ultimate release. My point, and thank you for that, my point is that it should come as no surprise to anybody observing the relationship between the United States and Iran that for the first time in a very long time, the ability to have bilateral discussion suddenly occurred outside the context of tribunal uh, action. This was bilateral discussion that was able to take place as a result of the JCPOA negotiation. Uh, I know that that opened the door for discussions regarding the disposition of the Americans, and I know that it opened the door for discussion regarding the resolution of these long-standing disputes. So the fact that these all took place in a period of time which was coincidental is as a result not of just sudden coincidence, but as a result of a change in the nature of relationship between the two governments. So that I was that. I know I've exceeded my time. Thank Thomas you. Thomas Thank you very much. Sorry. Gentleman from Maine, Mr. Poliquin, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, very much. I appreciate it. Uh, Ms. Grosch, I believe you stated in your opening statement you've been at the, uh, at the State Department dealing with these claims settlement process for about 30 years? Yes, that's correct. Okay, about 30 years. Thank you. And you've been involved in a number of different transactions. Um, how many of them have been settled in cash? Uh, to, to be clear, um, I'm not involved in the, the exact okay, well, financial the transactions, the, the but I have... The best knowledge, the settlements that you have been involved with, is it common for these settlements to be um, uh, uh, disposed of in cash? Again, I think as I uh, raised, uh, Congressman, with one of your colleagues, there have been various pretty large settlements over time, some small. Each one has been sui generis, and there has been a difference in the way uh, many of those Okay, so, uh, so you're not going to answer me the paid. question how common it is to use cash. Let's just move on. You know, I've got to be very honest with you. I'm very concerned about this, and I think all kinds of uh, Americans across our great land are concerned about this. Uh, I certainly know the people that I represent up in Maine are very concerned about this. Now, let's step back for a minute. We have a government that is, has vowed to wipe our major ally in the Middle East, really our only one that we trust, I think, Israel off the face of the earth. And they vowed to kill as many Americans as they can, and they have blood on their hands right now. And you've been working on a claim settlement here that dates back 37 years. 
And you testified, Ms. Grosch, earlier today that because of the sanctions in place back in January, that there was an inability to transfer $1.7 billion from America to Iran because of the banking system problems, because of the sanctions, which we now know is not true. So all of a sudden, we have a wire transfer going from this country to a bank account in Europe somewhere, Switzerland, I presume, where it's then converted into cash, $400 million of principal payments and $1.3 billion in cash. And that is transferred to a pallet or, or a series of pallets and put on a cargo plane in Europe before it's flown to Tehran. So my question to you is since we don't want any of this cash to land in the, hand, land in the hands of terrorists who are trying to kill Americans in the Middle East, who at the other end of that transaction, Ms. Grosch? You worked on this transaction for a long time. Who in Europe, when that cash was put on wooden pallets before it was sent over to uh, Tehran, what top-ranking American official was there to see that cash? Who? Um, I'm, I'm really not in a position to answer that because I was involved in the settlement. I believe some of my colleagues here today Ms. McCord, uh, you know who it was? Those. Who was the top-ranking American official who was on the ground in Europe when that cash was put on a pallet before it was flown over to Tehran? Who was it? I'm also not. Okay, so you don't know. Mr. Hearn, do you know? You work for Treasury. Sir, as I stated in my... Uh, okay, opinion, you sir. weren't involved. Mr. Backmire, do you know somebody? Do you have a name for me? Uh, Congressman, let me, let me address your particular... Do you concern. have a name for me who is the top-ranking U.S. official who was on the ground when the cash was put on the pallet? Congressman, I would be happy to brief you in a closed setting on okay, all of Ms. the Gross, details. Okay, Mr. Gross, let's go back to you since you're not going to answer me. Okay, do we know when the cash was, was transported from this airport in Europe to Tehran... Who is the top-ranking Iranian official who is in receipt of that cash? Um, I, I was not does there. Anybody I know? negotiated the... Okay, does anybody know? We're going to have the same stall here. Does anybody know? Sir, as I mentioned in my opening statement, the cash was eventually dispersed to a, a representative of the Central Bank of Iran. Okay. Was this someone who represented the military? Or was it someone who rep represented economic development in Iran? Who was it? What's it was, his name? He was an official of the Central Bank okay, of Iran. Okay, do you have a name for me? I don't recall his name, sir. Yo, you, but you do have a name. You just don't recall it now, correct? Sir, so there are a variety of people. Okay, um, so you do. There is a person, though, correct? And you have that name. You just told me. I think you just referred. You don't recall who it is. That means there is someone and there is a name, correct? So there were a variety of officials involved in this transaction. I'd have to take that question back. So if our office got in touch with yours, Mr. Hearn, you could tell us who that individual was, or those individuals were, can't you? We will take that inquiry back, sir. Say it again? I, I will take that inquiry back, sir. I didn't hear you. My ears are bad. I will take your inquiry back, sir. You take my inquiry back. No, I don't want the inquiry back. I want the answer. I want to know who was in receipt of that cash when that when those pallets of cash landed in Tehran. Here's why. Here's the problem, Mr. Hearn. We don't have any idea where this cash went. We don't know who received it. We don't know what it was used for, and it's untraceable. And it's with a country that is the state sponsor of terrorism, one of the three state sponsors of terrorism in this world. Don't you think that's a problem, Mr. Hearn? We don't even know who received the cash. A couple of points, sir. One, uh, to carry on the, uh, the comments of my colleague, I would commend to you the testimony of Acting Undersecretary Zubin, uh, who has testified about the, the funds uh, freed up by the JCPOA and has testified about the deep economic hole that Iran was in to the tune of half a trillion dollars. Um, and so I, I would commend that testimony. Cash to is the currency yeah. of terrorism. The, the this is a state sponsor of terrorism that received $1.7 billion of cash on a pallet in Tehran. Our office will be in touch with yours, Mr. Hearn, so we can find out who the, the Iranian officials were who were in receipt of that cash. Thank you, Mr. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Ellison, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Ranking Member. You know, Mr. Chair, I just want to say that I think that this, we always have to understand that all of the things we talk about in this committee take place within a certain context. And I'd like just to remind folks, January 15, 2013, no, actually that's the date that this uh, document I'm reading from was cited, but actually it was on the night of Barack Obama's inauguration, a group of top GOP luminaries gathered together in a Washington Steakhouse and pledged to each other that they would make President Obama a one-term president and oppose every single thing he did. I'm telling you that since that time, we have seen committee after committee, issue after issue, 
relentlessly trying to make anything, anything uh, into a scandal or something like that. And I only want to say to my friends who are part of this, you literally are shaking the American people's faith in the institutions of this nation by pursuing that strategy. You said Obama was going to be one term president. Well, you lost. And you know what? I, I, I wish that people would just come to their senses and do what was right for the American people. Um, and I'm going to keep on hoping that we do that. Now, let me just say this also. Um, I've read reports in the press that the Treasury Department worked with foreign partners to effectuate the transfer of funds as part of the Hague Tribunal settlement payment. Uh, first of all, this money that we've been talking about, was this, were these funds that were always Iranian funds that we froze? That's a question to anybody on the panel. The 400, Congressman, the $400 million that was paid immediately, that came, those were Iranian funds in the FMS trust fund that's held in the Treasury. And why were they Iranian funds? What, make, what made them Iranian funds? Uh, these were funds that were paid into the FMS trust fund during the course of the Iranian uh, foreign military sales program. And as I noted earlier, well, that was... What one, year? This would have been from the, throughout the 1970s and up through 1979 when we had the Memorandum of Understanding. So back in the 70s, they paid us some money for us, some items, and we froze that money after the seizure of our embassy. Uh, there, there was a blocking prior to the, uh, uh, sorry, following the taking of the embassy, the 1981 Algiers Accords uh, addressed issues that, that had been taken in response to the hostage taking. The trust fund had always been there. There was a memorandum of understanding, and Iran pointed to that um, as a basis for its claim that those funds were to be a return to Iran. Okay, so reports indicate that you worked with both the Dutch as well as the Swiss Central Bank. Can you confirm that? Uh, sir, we, we did work with a variety of uh, okay, partners fair in, enough. in this transaction. Now, it was reported in the press that at least one member of Congress said that the U.S. flew pallets of U.S. dollars to Tehran. Would you say that that statement would be accurate? Pallets of U.S. dollars. Is that what happened? That, that is inaccurate, sir. Inaccurate. Inaccurate. Okay, so you said inaccurate. That, that's correct. As I mentioned in my opening statement, in both transactions, the funds were converted to a foreign currency. They were then withdrawn as foreign currency banknotes. Right, US but dollars. you should understand that the whole country is watching this. This is sort of like a theatrical performance, and I don't want to be inarticulate about this. The claim that there was some pallet of U.S. dollars flown from America to Tehran is a false statement. Uh, would you, would, and you said, you used the term inaccurate. Right? That, that's correct. U.S. dollars were not dispersed to Iran. Right, right. So um, can you mention what foreign financial institutions were involved? Uh, weren't these major institutions? I mean, there's some implication that there's some shady, obscure stuff going on. Were these major reputable institutions that we're talking about who helped facilitate the transfer? Sir, what I can say is that uh, our partners uh, in both transactions were different central banks, national central banks. Um, in the first transaction, it was the Swiss National Bank. Uh, in the second transaction, it was the National Bank of the Netherlands, the Dutch National Bank. Now, look, in my 38 seconds remaining, I just want to pursue this. I have seen some of my colleagues demanding names of individuals who are somehow played some role uh, in facilitating the, the whole transaction. As just a member of Congress who uh, has class of rules around classified information and who has a general commitment to protect and safeguard the lives, interests, and the means and methods of U.S. Uh, engagement, particularly with foreign uh, power, I mean, uh, I mean, is, how would you regard that? Is that appropriate to disclose the names of individuals? And would it jeopardize U.S. national interest to do so in a public open hearing like this? Congressman, it's certainly our preference to discuss those details in a close setting. For the interest of the United States government. Exactly. And people. Exactly. All right. I'll, I'll yield back. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Hill, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the panel for being here. And, of course, uh, we're not here to talk about Obamacare. We're not here to talk about uh, Donald Trump. We're here in an open hearing to try to give some clarity uh, to this transaction that has been, and I think, uh, inadequately disclosed by the administration. So the fact that we're doing part of this 
not in a classified setting, is for the benefit of the American people so that they have more clarity about this transaction and all the details around it. And I thank the uh, chairman <clears throat> for scheduling it. Uh, I'm confused because my friend from South Carolina began talking about President Clinton's signing of the Victims uh, Act back in 2000, and that's sort of related also to uh, my friend's comments from Minnesota. Um, uh, I'm used to gap accounting and uh, not government double speak and double counting, but I'm trying to understand that if, uh, as you said, Ms. Grosch, that the $400 million was in that 2000 Act was appropriated by Congress, did we release Iran then from their $400 million obligation? Because we keep talking about it as if we froze this account in 1979 and then pursuant to the Algiers Accord, that money was still sitting there and we paid interest on it. But in fact, we in that act paid out $400 million of appropriated money. So is the $400 million then remaining in the FMS account not the United States' money? In other words, was Iran released from that obligation? Congressman, if I could try to clarify that, um, under the Victims uh, of Trafficking Act, uh, Congress appropriated $400 million. This would be in subsection B of that act that was referred to earlier. Uh, funds not otherwise made available in an amount not to exceed the total amount in the foreign military sales account at the date of enactment, which was $400 million. Then in a subsequent provision of that act, the United States government, because those were appropriated funds, the United States government was then subrogated to those claims, meaning that they became the claims of the U.S. government. And the U.S. government was then in a position to pursue those claims against Iran. And so in the overall settlement, we factored in those claims in reaching the settlement that we did in January. Well, that seems, and you both used that term, factored into the overall settlement, but it just seems in conflict with that law to me in my reading of it. It says, no funds shall be paid to Iran or released to Iran from property blocked under the International Emergency Economic Powers Act or from the Foreign Military Sales Fund until subrogated claims have been dealt with to the satisfaction of the United States. And so, uh, in my view, the satisfaction of the United States includes the people of the United States and the people's representatives uh, here in Congress. So whose signature, whose wet signature authorized this settlement? Did Secretary Liu approve this settlement and make the recommendation to President Obama? Um, I, I'm really not in a position to know at what level, Mr. but Hart, I believe... Can you shed light on that? Was this the... Was this, I know the State Department led the negotiations, but who, who approved this transaction and its structure? Did Secretary Liu approve it? The, the, this settlement was the subject of uh, a number of interagency discussions, as you can imagine. Um, Secretary Liu, acting under Secretary Zubin, uh, were part of those discussions. Um, I, I don't know the answer to your question beyond that. And Secretary Liu, of course, was the director of OMB in 2000, so I assume he knows the details of, of this public law 106-386 in this particular paragraph since he was the director of Office of Management and Budget at that time. Um, I, can you, I want to give you another shot at explaining how it factored into the overall settlement, though, because the way I take it is we released them, and in fact, we, the taxpayers, ought to get $400 million plus accrued interest, and yet we've paid it out as a part of this overall settlement, and that's double counting to me. Uh, I just am not clear on your point. Maybe I could give you an example. Um, at the top of my remarks, I mentioned that in 1990, we entered into a settlement with Iran. It settled both U.S. <laughs> government claims and U.S. national claims for $105 million. In my experience in claims practice, it's not unusual to settle multiple claims together at the same time. And if those are the claims of the U.S. government, we take all those into account, just as we could uh, counterclaims. And so um, in the negotiation of this claim settlement with Iran, we had discussions about those claims, and they were settled along with um, the, the uh, trust fund issues. Well, I thank you for that answer, but Mr. Chairman, I remain confused that this is somehow double counting, and uh, I urge our committee staff uh, in discussions to get to the bottom of that. Last question I have for the Treasury official, were there any IRGC members on the uh, Iran air flight that picked up this money and took it back to Tehran? Uh, as I said, the, the money was dispersed to a representative of the Central Bank of Iran. Um, the, as I understand it, there were no uh, specially designated nationals involved. 
Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the ranking member uh, of this subcommittee, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Witnesses, I thank you and I compliment you for being truthful and forthright. This hearing today has taken us back 35 years, thereabout, maybe a little bit more, to the Algiers Accords. And I think it was appropriate that we do this. But I also think it appropriate for us to go back to the inauguration of President Obama because it was around that time that persons met and concluded, in fact pledged, that they would do everything that they could to stop the president. That's what Politico reported, stop the president. But I have in my hands what I'd like to place in the record a, an article styled, The Republicans Plan for New President. And this article addresses the notion that on the night of Obama's inauguration, a group of top GOP luminaries, as was indicated by another member, quietly gathered in a Washington steakhouse. They were there to lick their wounds. But ultimately, they created this plan on how to deal with the incoming administration. This is a furtherance of the plan. And for those who are curious as to persons in attendance, without going through all of the luminaries, I think it appropriate to say that the current Speaker of the House was in the House. I think it fair to say, as reported in this article, and by the way, there are other reports. CNN has reported on this. It's been reported widely. But it's fair to say that the current majority leader had a leadership role. He was there too. So with this kind of pledge made to each other, it just seems appropriate that the style of this hearing would be we kept our word, and we are keeping our word, and anything that this president brings up, we will oppose it. And that has been the record. The record is replete with specific examples of how they have opposed everything this president has brought forth. But I'll be very candid with you. I did not believe that it would get to this point. There are families, I have two, who have relatives who are being held hostage. Can you imagine what these families have to conclude when they hear people saying that somehow giving, returning money to people that belong to them and seeing our people come home, that there's something inappropriate about this? These families are suffering. I meet with them regularly. I know their pain. They want their loved ones to come home. We ought to be proud of the fact that we didn't give a ransom and we did bring them home. This was the money that belonged to the Iranians. There was a prisoner swap. We have Americans who were brought home. My God, can we not credit the president with something? He's made a difference in the lives of these people. But this is not about this specific transaction. It's really about a deal that was cut on the night of the inauguration thereabout to do everything to disenfranchise this president. Who would have thought that members of Congress would say that the president wasn't born in the United States of America. The president of the United States of America, not born, not an American. It has continued, it has been consistent, and they have been persistent. But we have to stand by truth. Remember, William Cullen Bryant, truth crushed to earth shall rise again. 
Remember Carlisle, no lie can live forever. Remember Martin King, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. History will not be kind to these who would do what they are doing to this president, pursuant to a deal that was made. You're keeping your word. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Pittenger, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for calling this very important hearing. Mr. Ahern, uh, are you old enough to know the TV show Dragnet? I am, sir. You are Sergeant Friday? He's one of my favorite characters, sir. Then you recall Just the Facts, ma'am, Just the Facts? Yes, sir. He was uh, renowned for that line, and I think that's all I'd request today. I'm going to ask a series of questions, and I would like uh, your response, just the facts, if I could. Mr. Ahern, what, who exactly was in charge in gathering the $400 million in currency? What level of staff is tasked to gather the $400 million in cash, place it on a plane, and send it to a foreign government? How were these dollars packaged? Was the military used to fly the plane, to fly the money to Iran? How did Iran receive the cash? Please take a moment and articulate the exact process of the money exchange from the moment the State Department went to the bank and withdrew the cash the moment Iran received the money. Uh, sir, as I said, uh, there were two payments. They flowed in generally the same uh, manner, but I'll, I'll break them down into two payments and, and walk through the flow, uh, how, they, how they each worked. Um, with respect to the $400 million principal that was held in the FMS account, um, that those funds were transferred uh, to the an account of the Swiss National Bank. Um, I mean, who, who gathered, who's in charge of gathering that money? I'm sorry, sir? Who's in charge of gathering the $400 million? Well, this was a, uh, it was a wire transfer to, to that account. Once in that account, the uh, foreign national bank converted those funds. And, and who initiated the wire transfer? Uh, that was initiated by the, uh, as I said in my opening statement, the Defense Finance and Accounting Service. I'm sorry, Service. I missed that, but it was kindly convey that? So that was a, it was a uh, Department of Defense controlled account. And so the Defense Finance and Accounting Service, DFAS, um, was the one to initiate that wire payment. We, we helped them uh, build the wire instruction to do that. The funds were then transferred to the, the foreign central bank, which converted them uh, into Swiss francs. Um, the, those material, uh, th those francs were then uh, withdrawn as bank notes. They were transported from one location uh, in Switzerland to Geneva. And there they were dispersed to a representative of the Central Bank of Iran. With respect to the second payment, the uh, $1.3 billion uh, that rep represented the compromise of interest uh, pursuant to the settlement agreement, that money was, was transferred again from the judgment fund, which is the, uh, the fund that, that Congress has authorized for the payment of judgments and uh, settlements when there is no other appropriated fund. Um, it was transferred to the account of uh, another central bank, um, again, the Central Bank of the Netherlands. Um, it was converted into euros at that stage. It was withdrawn um, as, as bank notes, um, pursuant to an arrangement between the United States, uh, the home government of that central bank, and, and Iran. Um, that bank then dispersed those funds to uh, representatives of the, of the central was bank. Was there a receipt Iran. for all these fund transfers? Was there a receipt given? Uh, for which leg, sir? Well, when the, the, when the funds were received, when, when money's transferred, there's acknowledgement and there's a receipt. Was there a receipt given for the transfers? Do we have access to those receipts? I, I'm not familiar with the answer to that question, sir. I'd have to take that back. Well, I would like to know uh, what type of receipt was received uh, in, in what manner uh, from Iran uh, to the United States uh, for the the $40 million. Uh, Mr. Ahern, considering the funds that were received, uh, what confidence do you have that this money was not diverted immediately toward terrorist interest in organizations? Uh, again, to, uh, um, to carry on the, some of the comments that uh, my colleagues have made in the past, and also uh, I would commend to you the, the testimony of uh, our Acting Assistant Secretary uh, Zubin. Recently, with respect to the funds that were released uh, pursuant to the JCPOA, um, and he, he, has, he has testified in, in detail about um, the deep hole that the Iranian economy was in to the tune of uh, half a trillion dollars. Um, 
And so while we, while we can't track uh, any particular uh, banknote, um, we do know that Iran had a very significant domestic need uh, for funds. Um, I can also say that the, the Treasury Department is committed to identifying and countering terrorist financing, its facilitators, its networks. We have an entire office, the Office of Terrorism and Financial Intelligence, um, that combines all the national security functions of the department under one roof. Um, that office's well, primary question. mission, in fact, the reason it was established was to counter terrorist financing, and we continue to be focused on countering terrorist financing and its networks. These negotiations are, are scripted and very well thought through and in an effort to make sure that there's no mistakes uh, intentionally. Uh, how could this be done without recognizing that $400 million would be transferred at simultaneously that the hostages were being released? Was there not a full recognition of the, that that would be taking place and at least the perception of that reality? Congressman, if I may interject to, to answer your question. Uh, as I've mentioned, uh, it, it was a fact that we tried to resolve multiple lines of business all or on around the same time. That included the Iranian nuclear deal, which we were implementing, and the IEA had verified that weekend that uh, Iran had met its commitments uh, under that deal. Uh, we were trying to resolve the prisoner release and the return of our American citizens back to the United States. Uh, and as I mentioned previously, that was uh, there was a reciprocal humanitarian gesture with respect to Iranian nationals that were in the United States. Uh, and we were trying to resolve this particular issue with respect to the settlement of the claims uh, because we thought that this judgment was in the interest of the United States. And we did so, we did so all at the same time because there was a momentum that would, did not exist for the past three decades. Uh, and we were fearful that if we let one or two of these lines of effort drag out and we did not conclude them all at the same time, uh, that we would jeopardize our... Uh, uh, my time has ended. I will just say that I was there to receive Pastor Abedini in Germany. And he heard the conversation between with one of the guards that they're waiting for a plane to come in the, with the cash. He's made all, already a public statement on that. The, Thank you very much. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, I would note uh, that we are going to move to a second round of questionings of the panel. I'm going to yield uh, to the ranking member for uh, a brief moment to uh, voice an objection. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do object, and I will be more explicit with my objection with the uh, five minutes that I will consume in the second round. Uh, but I do object and would ask that uh, we not have another round of this. And duly noted, and it is in the prerogative of the chair to go to a second round. Um, uh, so the chair now recognizes himself for five minutes. I want to go to a few points of clarification. Um, again, who authorized the payment? That question has been asked for numerous times. Mr. Ahern, I think you indicated that at least Mr. Liu was involved uh, in knowledge of this agreement, correct? So I think it's unsurprising that with a transaction of, Agreed. of this nature that it, it would involve discussions involving Mr. the Mr. Of officials. Was Mr. Kerry apprised of this? Sir, Mr. Or Secretary Kerry has been deeply involved in all of our discussions with Iran. This has been subject to a vigorous and, debate within and our the president was aware of this as the well. Cabinet of the United States. I said, I gotta, I'm going through some quick cleanup. President was aware of uh, as well of this deal. Absolutely correct. President was aware. Highest of levels. Okay. Uh, when these uh, deals in the tribunal are, are uh, resolved, there's a settlement agreement that is put out. Uh, a settlement agreement in regard to this deal has not been released. Is a settlement agreement forthcoming? I believe I could ask, answer that question, uh, Congressman. The, um, typically what happens at the tribunal, if there is a settlement, and this would have been applied to U.S. national settlements as well as government settlements, they are affirmed as, a, as an award on agreed terms and they would be attached to Is there a settlement agreement forthcoming? The, the parties in this situation, because there are, it was, there are pending claims at the tribunal, the parties asked the tribunal not to record it as, a, <laughs> as an award. There, there, there's been pending claims at the tribunal for 37 years, and a settlement agreement has been released. Yes, um, I would expect that a settlement agreement, so the American people can see what the deal truly was, um, should be forthcoming, uh, and it's of concern to this committee that it is, uh, has not been released and appears by your testimony yes, is there, not forthcoming. There are claims continuing. In fact, today my office is filing a submission in the FMS claims with the Iran-U.S. Claims Tribunal. So and there is a lot of concern well, about the fact that those claims are ongoing and we do not want to undermine any U.S. positions. And, and um, the, Iran knows of this deal. Um, it's just that we, the American people, want to know about it as well. And I'm sure if you share it with us, you don't undermine your negotiating position with Iran because they were part of it. 
Um, in regard to the $400 million, uh, I think you all indicated there was a claim by the victims uh, of Iranian terror lien on that $400 million. You all agree to that? Uh, has that lien been released now that that $400 million has been paid? Um, this, the statute really doesn't provide for a lien, um, so well, we, I'm we not heard, sure what you're really talking so we heard about. This, but there, there's a claim to the money. Mr. Um, uh, Mulvaney read that to you, and you agreed that there was a, a claim or a lien, however you want to phrase it, for statute on the money. It was subrogated to the United States government. That's so, correct. So That's now, that, now that that $400 million has been released to Iran, who is going to pay the claims to the uh, victims of Iranian terror? The, the victims of Iranian terrorism who had those judgments were already paid in 2000. So there's no outstanding claims? There are outstanding so claims. So who's going to pay those outstanding claims? Uh, those individuals have pursued litigation in U.S. courts. They've received judgments. And as far as I'm aware, they're they are pursuing, get, they're they're are pursuing get, attachments. So is, uh, is, to, is, is the U.S. government going to be responsible for those claims? Uh, they are the claims of the U.S. nationals, and they do not become the claims of the U.S. government unless they're subrogated or unless the U.S. government formally uh, exercises diplomatic protection. I want to go quickly here. Um, as part of the Iran nuclear deal, assets um, were unfrozen, were thawed, if you will. Uh, as part of that deal, were any of those assets uh, transferred um, or converted into cash and also transferred back to Iran? Uh, Congressman, the sanctions relief in the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, was quite different. Uh, you are correct that the sanctions were lifted that had previously restricted those funds, and, and those sanctions were lifted, and Iran then uh, was, it was up to Iran to access those funds. And were they able to access those funds um, in cash? Uh, at that point, once those sanctions restrictions were lifted, it would be up between them and whatever bank they had their funds in. So are you aware of did, did, they, did they get uh, large transfers of uh, hard currency back to Iran that you're aware of? I'm not aware of how Iran is ultimately, uh, or how, the, how any funds were ultimately dis dispersed to Iran. Uh, what we know is were that... Were any dispersed to Iran? So we got the 1.7 billion in cash. Did they get any other cash payments by way of us on freezing their assets? Well, Congressman, it's worth remembering yes no. that these were... Yes or no. I got a limited time. Yes or no. Did they get more cash? These were Iranian funds in Iranian accounts overseas. I know that. And so they did, used those funds to so buy and trade and do things like that. So, so is it fair to say they got more cash um, shipments in with hard currency because we unfroze their assets? Yes, right? No, I'm not, I'm not sure that it is. I don't, I don't know how Iran would have yeah. sought the disposition of its assets overseas. One last question. Um, this deal that you say is so great um, was... Uh, was a determination from the tribunal imminent. So I was a prior prosecutor. Before the jury comes back, the jury's about to come in or the judge is about to rule, the parties settle. Was the judge about to rule? Was there an in imminent settlement of this deal that was pending that made you have to act and settle for $1.7 billion? As, as I mentioned in my opening, the, Iran was pressing very hard to go to That's hearing. That's not my question. I didn't, ask you, I, no, no, hold, I didn't ask you if they're pressing you. I asked you if a settlement or a determination by the tribunal was imminent. Not whether they're pressing you. They've probably been pressing for 37 years. At that was point there a in time, it was imminent? our judgment that there was, going, that there was a possibility of a judgment coming uh, very soon. So the, hearing held, the hearings had been had. Um, all the evidence was with the tribunal, and they're about to make a decision. Is that your testimony? My testimony is that... Uh, Iran was pr pressing for a preliminary determination about this issue uh, regarding the disposition of the trust fund and interest. So there was, was no our determination that it was much better to have a decision made uh, to, to resolve this so for a much there, smaller amount there, than what we thought there, the tribunal could have rendered. So there was no eminent determination on the horizon. My time has expired, um, and I will now recognize the uh, ranking, the ranking uh, member, Mr. Green, for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I'm a former judge, and I can say to you from experience that when the litigants sense what the ruling of the court will be, it becomes imminent at that point. You don't have to say it for it to become imminent, but when they sense that there's a ruling that may be adverse to their best interests, it's not unusual for those who are litigating to act. Mr. Chairman, I want you to know that 
We are displeased with the hearing, and I want to thank all of my colleagues who have appeared and who are prepared to return. But this really has become now about more than oversight. It's about micromanaging the presidency. More specifically, micromanaging President Barack Obama. The president should have the latitude to negotiate international affairs. It's inherent in the power of the executive branch. But we want to micromanage this president. A deal was made, and to the extent that the deal can be consummated, we would go this far. I think that it would be a disservice for us on this side to legitimize a continuation of this fiasco. There are some things that you just don't do. You don't participate in your own demise. You don't allow people to create a petard by which you can be hoist. There are some things you just don't do. To continue with this is a disservice to the committee itself because this has become about nothing more than confusion and an attempt to honor a commitment that was made when the president was inaugurated. So I thank you for allowing me to, pursuant to the rules, of course, make this comment. And I'm going to ask that all of the members on our side make, a, make better use of your time. This has gone too far already, and we're not going to take it any further. With that, not only do I yield back my time, but I will make my departure. Thank you, Mr. Ricky. Member, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Hill, for five minutes. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, on the issue of uh, the ransom topic, uh, I know that uh, the Department of State and the U.S. government has been expressed displeasure in the past when uh, Germany paid 5 million euros uh, in Mali uh, and when France paid 25 million euros uh, in, in Mali um, for to Al-Qaeda. And then it was something that we've tried to enforce through all of our diplomatic channels and our leadership channels as the United States. And public reports say that al-Qaeda has, between 2008 and 2014, gotten about 125 million euros and uh, paid ransom for tourists or captives that have been returned to their countries. So my concern is that no matter what it's called, uh, you've got an appearance problem. And I think that is uh, something that was poor judgment in the, part, <clears throat> in the process of the negotiating uh, effort. And secondly, to Chairman Royce's point, this issue of cash is really disturbing uh, to me, and I think it is to anyone who's been a former Treasury official, as I have on my resume. You just don't provide cash to the number one state sponsor of terrorism. And the, as Chairman Royce pointed out, the tribunal regulations permit it. And clearly, this was the, an Iranian request, and we acceded to it. And it was, um, in my view, um, not the right uh, decision in the best interest of the American people because of we know what is done with cash in the hands of the number one state sponsor of terrorism. Uh, and you also have testified today that it's, uh, I think, Mr. Uh, Backmeyer, you commented on the state of the Iranian economy and whether you're at the desk officer at the Assistant Secretary for International Economic Policy at State or over in OASIA, sure, people write estimates of the state of our friends and foes around the world, but with an $800 million approximately purchase price parity in GDP, taking the midpoint of the public number of what was freed up in the JCPOA of $100 billion, yes, 20 percent of GDP. So if they want to help the Iranian people, maybe they can cut down on a $20 billion defense budget and not be looking to that as a reason in negotiations to be, you know, kind-hearted in settling for a higher interest payment than you think perhaps they should have received. 
So I really think if we want uh, the Iranians to have a better economy and take care of their, quote, domestic uh, infrastructure needs, they ought to rearrange how they spend their money and not spend so much money threatening their neighbors, threatening the United States, threatening the people of uh, Israel. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields uh, back. Uh, I would just uh, like to note as uh, we are going to wrap up this portion of the hearing, uh, I thank the panel for their service to our country. Uh, I know how hard all of you work. I know you've gotten tough questions today, uh, but do know that uh, the Congress and this committee respects uh, your work, though we might uh, have some disagreement with uh, what's taken place in regard to, um, in regard to this deal. Um, I would just note that you may get follow-up uh, questions uh, from uh, committee members uh, that I'd ask you to answer in a reasonable amount of time. I would just also note specifically to State and uh, to Treasury, we have sent over written uh, requests for documentation. It has been over a month. There has been zero production from uh, either State or Treasury documents that we are entitled to. I'd ask you to take that message back to your superiors and please provide uh, those documents that are uh, duly uh, owed to the Congress. Uh, with that, again, uh, thank you. Uh, our committee is now going to stand in recess for uh, five minutes as we switch out panels. <laughs>